Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It's December 14th, 2020, and I am over the moon excited to have Heather Gay and Dre Nord back. Uh, they are they are both appearing in uh, season one of Real Housewives of Salt Lake City on Bravo TV. Heather is one of the main six cast members, and Dre has been appearing um, as, as Heather's friend and business <laughs> partner, uh, they have a business together. They have these amazing stories. Um, on uh, Mar Margie and I have been loving watching uh, Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. We're five episodes in to season one. It's a lot of fun. It's crazy. Uh, but what you don't get to see are are the real people and the real women kind of behind the theatrics. I don't know if, if is it okay to say that, guys? Oh, yeah. Is there some theatrics? It's, a, it's entertainment. It's not a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, and so, um, yeah, and so we're five, five, five episodes in, and if you didn't get a chance, we spent three hours with Heather and Dre uh, just last week on the previous episode, and it's such an amazing story. Just to recap briefly, um, Dre, Dre grew up in Virginia in, in some of those elite Orthodox Mormon wards. Dre was an Orthodox Mormon in every way. Uh, she She got married young, probably a little bit too young, and uh, had a kid, and then in that process, Dre realized that the church wasn't what she thought, and she ended up getting divorced from her first husband. She also has this really epic story uh, about uh, women in the church and perfectionism and how her mom almost almost took her life and how inspiring that was uh, for Dre to make the most of the life that she has and how courageous it was for her mom to take the step she did after realizing that the Orthodox Mormon path wasn't working for her. So go back and watch the first episode. You'll love Dre's story. And Heather's story is uh, just as compelling and as fascinating. Heather growing up, again, an Orthodox Mormon in Denver, moving to Salt Lake City, experiencing that culture shock of, uh, of uh, coming to Utah as an Orthodox Mormon. It's kind of like coming to Oz. It's like when Dorothy comes to Oz and uh, meets the wizard and and realizes that maybe Oz wasn't what what she thought. I don't know if you like that <laughs> yeah, metaphor, I think Heather. That's a good analogy. <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> but what it was like growing up in in uh, Olympus High School in Holiday, Utah for Heather. A great story. She goes to BYU, does not have a fantastic BYU experience in terms of dating, but starts to show her entrepreneurial chops, which end up emerging later, and we'll be talking about that today. But Heather also talks about going to BYU and what that was like and then serving a mission in France. One of the highlights for me last episode, Heather, was you bearing your testimony in French, but also sharing many of your Orthodox beliefs uh, as, a, as an Orthodox Mormon. Because my, my view is you're, you're the most Mormon uh, of the Real Housewives uh, to Agreed. me. Agreed. Uh, well, what's that? Agreed. That's a really low bar. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. We'll talk about how Mormon you you really are and were and have been. Um, but but just hearing how you went through all the different um, all the different beliefs that you had that was a highlight for me and how emotional you got talking about how raw things are and how important the church has been and how central it's been for you. That was really powerful for me. So. Yes. We're going to be talking about uh, that. Um, we, we left last episode talking about how Heather, after her mission, moves out to L.A. area, finds Billy Gay, and gets married. But we did not at all dig into Heather's story. So we're going to begin today with a focus on Heather's story with Billy and this, uh, this marriage and the kids and everything that happens. And then we're going to weave Dre back in, and then we're going to start talking about their friendship and then their business partnership and their amazing business. And then maybe we'll end talking a little bit about um, maybe a little bit about what it's like to be on the show, but not in any way where we're trying to talk about plot or characters, just about, <laughs> just about uh, what it's like maybe a little bit uh, to be a real housewife. So without any further ado, uh, uh, I like to say Gay and Dre, welcome back to <laughs> Mor Mormon Stories Podcast. We've been rebranded as Gay and Dre. Do you guys like to refer yourself as? Drether. Drether. You guys have a podcast, right? Yeah, we, we do. Have a podcast. Yeah. And we introduce ourselves every time as together yeah. we are Drether. I love it. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so if it's all right, let's let's start back with you, Heather. You you talked to us about meeting Billy in, yeah. in L.A., but we don't know anything about that whirlwind of a romance or whatever you want to call it. So. Yeah, it was you know it was a whirlwind in a lot of ways. I had graduated from BYU. I had returned from my mission. I um, was starting the next phase of my life with a very, very clear focus, which was to find a spouse and get married and, you know, begin what had been like, what I'd been kind of perpetually putting on hold, not even, I'm not putting it on hold, but just, you know, been trying to accomplish and it hadn't happened yet. So now there was even hyper focus because I was 21 No, now I'm 23, right? I'm home. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. I'm tw- yeah I'm 22 and a half. Then, <laughs> Women went on missions. Yeah, I went, I went at 21 and was there for 18 months and then came home and I went to Huntington Beach, to the Huntington Beach Singles Ward, kind of the mecca of Mormonism, um, target-rich environment, as <laughs> Tom Cruise would say <laughs> in Top Gun, and a opportunity to, um, you know, meet my eternal companion and begin a family, you know, kind of. It, it feels like that's how you really start. That's the only way to progress, really. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I had done the token degree that was really just a Trojan horse for me to find a spouse. And I had, then I'd done the mission to, you know, have continued purpose in my life as a single Mormon woman. And then now it was like, you know, put the rubber meets the road. Like now it's. I'm getting up there. My eggs are expiring. I'm <laughs> slowly dwindling. Super old at 23. Yeah, I'm 23. Right. You're timing out. Basically. Yeah, I was timing out <laughs> and um, slogging it out, you know. And I I had a degree in humanities, and I didn't know what I was going to do. if I didn't, I didn't even allow myself to consider that I wouldn't get married. Did you ever consider law school, though? Yes. I know that's what you wanted, but was that an actual? Yeah, it was, I mean, yeah, it was a goal just in every other way that I'd had a goal so that I could face myself in the mirror and not just say, all I want is to get married and have babies. Sure. You know what I mean? So I would kind of try to be noble, but I mean, I'm just being totally honest. Like I wanted, if anyone had encouraged me or if that had been like something that wasn't just, didn't feel, it felt indulgent. It felt like indulgent and kind of like patronizing. Oh, you're going to have a career. You know what I mean? Like you're not, if you're a devout Mormon woman and you follow the family proclamation and you follow the guidelines of the church and you follow the plan of happiness, you know, like you are to stay home, nurture and raise a family. And that's, noble. And so everything else just kind of feels like, what's that term? Like talk, you know, just like filler. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of like, just, that'll be my side, my side hobby. Yeah. Just like, so I can. Like have, gardening. Yeah. 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 I'm Baking. serene. <laughs> yeah. Um, why law? <clears throat> well, why would not, you have, why would you have considered law? The only, the only reason I would have considered law is, well, there's a couple of reasons actually. That's not fair. You know, I referenced in part one of this podcast that I had a fourth or fifth grade teacher that during a mock trial said, you should be a lawyer. Great. And that was the only time anyone suggested a career to me or, um, you know, gave me any sort of encouragement. And so I just stuck to that because it sounded esteemed, you know, and it was, um, it just sounded like something I could do. And, and I had had a man tell me that I would be good at that. You know, and he didn't know that that would be the only time I would hear that I could be good at anything, you know, other than, and it doesn't, it wasn't that I couldn't be good at things. It was just that it, be good at everything, be as smart as you can, but don't miss the mark. You know what I mean? And the mark is to humble yourself, to get married, to build a family and to be a helpmeet and a companion. Such a strange word, Mm helpmeet. And it's, it's the perfect word though, because that's all. I was supposed to do was help my spouse meet his goals and his obligations. And I don't think that I'm not saying that in a way that I'm a martyr. I think there's an immense pressure on men in the church too, you know, to be huge providers and to be able to have a dignified career where the family can be 
wealthy where he'll be able to be promoted into leadership roles and advance in the church, you know, and have discretionary income and discretionary time. And those things tend to be synonymous with wealth. And I knew I wanted to marry someone wealthy too. I had grown up wealthy. I was a hard worker, but I knew that it was, a, you know, I wasn't, I knew I had to marry the package deal. I just, I'm going to say it honestly, because I did. And I went to Huntington Beach. I was working, um, I was selling shoes at Nordstrom for a while. And then I, for a couple months, and then I got a job in software and I was a tech writer and I quickly advanced to be like a business analyst in the company and I was doing well. And, um, I was living in Huntington beach and it was a crazy scene. It was so many single women and men, but it was probably four single women to every single man. And they were kind of Huntington beach boys. You know, there were a lot of transplants, a lot of guys that had come out there to surf and to be artists. And it was just kind of a, you know, I pretended that it was like this hodgepodge of like all the most creative, advanced, cool Mormons in the world. But that was um, the way that we all kind of looked at ourselves. But the truth was, you know, we are all rooted in our, in the principles of like, we were vying for the men's attention and we were hoping to get picked, you know, pick me, pick me. Mm. And that's just, you know, I, that's what I think is, I want to talk so much about is because it's not, this isn't what people say, but this is what we do. You know, of course we just say, oh, we're just young girls furthering our careers, having the time of our lives, but we weren't. We were trying to get asked out. We were trying to get married. And if we were honest at all with each other, we would say that was all we were trying to do. But you don't say that because first of all, it's degrading, you know, and it's, it's also totally disempowering because you don't have any control over whether someone likes you or someone asks you to marry them or, you know, it just felt, it just is kind of like this passive way to progress in life. And it's, it's hard. And the, and it's, it just felt like a lot of pressure. And I had been there about nine months and didn't really date. I dated a lot of guys at Nordstrom. I dated a lot of guys at work. I, I had a boyfriend that I, really, I mean, boyfriend, I was still following the standard of youth packet where I don't call anyone my boyfriend, you know what I mean? But it's just when you're an adult <laughs> woman, you know, you're just, but I wasn't having sex with anybody. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't an, a, having adult relationships. I was having flirtations and just kind of like stretching my legs a little bit with non-Mormon guys that were asking me out, but it was all, none of it was real. So I was never invested in it. So I didn't really develop any skills mm -hmm. in how to be in an adult intimate relationship. I mean, I wasn't having sex, but I also wasn't dealing with them on a authentic level at all. You know, emotional intimacy. Yeah. No emotional intimacy and no way to really break through that veneer of this is just pretend because you're not a candidate. And, um, yeah, and then I met my ex-husband, Billy, and I remember the night so clearly. I was, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers was playing in L.A. Nice. And Huntington Beach, you know, it's like 45 minutes south of L.A., maybe an hour. And I wanted to go and try to get scalp tickets and go to the concert with my roommate, Meredith. And that was our plan. And then she had a friend call her that she had worked at at Los Hermanos at, at BYU. And he said, <laughs> hey, uh, I just he had just moved in kind of or he'd been there for a minute. And he said, do you want to come over? And she said, do you want to go over to this guy, these guys apartment? And I said, well, who are they? And she said, well, um, Aaron's five, two or something. You know what I mean? She just like put it. That was the first thing she put out there. You know, like I don't, he wasn't five, two. He was like, Aaron's like five, five, you know? Sure. And she's like, and I don't think you'll think Billy's cute. And I just said, well, will they want to go to the concert? You know, like maybe we could all go to the concert together. And so we went over to their apartment and Billy had just moved in. And I thought Billy was super cute. You know, he was, I thought he was aloof and cool and funny. And he was flirtatious and he asked me out like that night. And that was kind of rare because we were just in that world of, you know, social activities and, um, you know, 
corn boils on the beach. And it was just kind of like a free-for-all melee of dating. There was, wasn't really courting going on. And he asked me to go to an, a singles ward activity in Irvine, which I thought was cute and, and kind of earnest of him, you know, and sweet. But I also thought it was a little like nerdy, you know, like, but it also kind of revealed to me that he didn't know, he hadn't been a uh, poisoned by the environment yet. You know, mm -hmm. he still thought he had to show up and like, you know, date. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Woo put you a little in. bit. Put some effort yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, he asked me out and we started dating and he was an entrepreneur and he had recently, uh, produced an extreme action sports video. That's kind of what he was doing, producing movies and very, very cool. He had this huge red truck that he threw his surfboard in. And the reason he had come to California was he was financially successful. He was an artist. He was doing these movies and he could sell them and work from anywhere. And he wanted to surf the world. So I, that curled my toes, you know, here's this Mormon adventurer with entrepreneurial and, you know, desires and, uh, he was into me. I mean, it just was like, this is cool. It was just really cool, you know? And he was a great boyfriend. I mean, he wasn't working, so he didn't surf the world. He just stayed there. And, um, if I were to tell it in his own words, when we moved to California or we moved from California to Utah and we had to deliver like our opening statement address in church, you know, where you say, oh, this mm -hmm. is our courting story and this is where we're at. And, <laughs> you know, the kind of introductory jokes for our sacrament meeting talks. He said, you know, I moved to Huntington Beach to surf the world. I met Heather kind of the night I moved in and I spent the next month, the next nine months and my life savings, you know, he was being funny, but I spent the next nine months, my knife's nine and my life savings convincing her to marry me. Mm. And that was, that narrative was romantic to me too, you know? Tell us a bit about his background. So he grew up in Agora Hills, California. Uh, That's Southern? Um, it's that... LA, it's a suburb of LA. Okay. okay. And he, um, his parents had grown up kind of together and met or had, had dated at BYU and gotten married. And he was the oldest of three. At the time, well, he was the only active child in his family. Really? And his family had been, uh, his mom had always been active. His dad had been less active until he was 15. And then they were sealed in the temple, in the Laie temple. And his mom was very, very devout. And his, his dad, um, you know, he was, a, he was participatory, you know, and they were sealed and they were active Mormons. Were they successful financially? Yeah. Okay. They're lots of money. Okay. They, so you checked that box. Yeah. I remember some guy came in that was kind of like a big shot and he was fawning all over Billy and I didn't, I hadn't really put it all together. And then it was clear that he had worked for Billy's dad and um, Billy's dad owned a publicly traded company. It was, you know, it was big money. And then Billy kind of told me the story of his uh, family's history with business and Mormonism and Mitt Romney and just all the big names. And it was just, you know, it was clear that they were a well-established, financially successful family. And that was important to me. You know, it was, it would have, it wouldn't have been a deal breaker, but it was certainly, it certainly, um, my mom would say greased the skids, you know, it just, it just made it all seem more palatable and more of a candidate. He was more, he was a candidate. They were, a prolific family, really well-respected, really well-liked and loved and esteemed. And that was totally important to me too. But I still felt superior because I was, I was a BIC, you know, I was born in the covenant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was, I was, <laughs> you know, there's a difference, you know, it's, if you look at your membership record, you're a BIC, you're born in the covenant. You, you are. And tell our listeners what that means. Born in the covenant means that you are born into a, uh, the new and everlasting covenant of eternal marriage, and you were a child born of that union. Meaning your parents were sealed, meaning your parents were sealed in a Mormon temple before you were born. Correct. It wasn't like someone, one of your parents joined later, or your parents And then you were all dressed later. in white and you were sealed later as a family. It was essentially that you uh, had an unfettered line, you know, like your parents had done it right. And I'm saying this, you know, flippantly because 
um, I think with my mentality back then, that mattered to me. Yeah. There was some, not status is the wrong word. There was some superiority, mm-hmm. probably is the right word. Mm-hmm. You know, I just, I'm from a true blue pioneer stock family and we do things right. And um, there's no aberration yeah. to the script. Right. So I, and I liked that he was the only active one. I thought that was really cool. So I was kind of flattered, I guess, that someone that followed the rules still wanted to hitch his wagon to my star. (laughs) Did he tell you what he loved about you? Um, Did he ever say it back then? We had a really strong sexual chemistry because it was all anticipatory, you know, and we weren't immoral. And so it's just like, we were two adults, like making out for hours <laughs> and hours, you know, Levi Lovin, as they call it. <laughs> and, and he, you know, we had, you know, there's so much I could say, but I really want to be respectful of, um, I mean, <sighs> Screw it. So it, he, there was, um, I'm, I'm going to tell this because it's, I think it's interesting to understand like my mentality. And if it's not interesting, just like kick yeah. my leg and I'll move on. I got you. But yeah, I think there was something about me that felt flattered that this righteous man was choosing me. And I attributed that to him having a lot of depth and a lot of insight and a lot of like kind of introspective self-awareness. And I kind of believed or told myself like he was in on the joke a little bit. Like we're gonna be cool Mormons, cool, socialized, amazing, righteous Mormons, powerhouse couple, but a little tongue in cheek too. Like we don't, you know what I mean? Like I, I didn't think he was gonna like toe the line completely. I thought I was the superior Mormon. Like I knew the doctrine, I knew the rules, I could, I was going to be the righteous one because that's how I, that's, I had that same experience in the temple we talked about in um, the first part of the podcast. Like I thought, well, there's no way that I'm going to, and I'd been to the temple for, you know, years because I went as a missionary and I went regularly and I just thought like, I'm going to run the show, but he's going to be a great partner. So the whole process, I just had to, flip it and make the script work for me. And I didn't feel connected to him. And he was really, um, we were getting more serious and we'd been dating about three months and it was St. Patrick's day. And we, I wanted to go to this party in Huntington beach, just, you know, a Mormon party with probably green milk and mint Oreos and, you know, big St. Patty's day thing. And he said, let's go camping. And he came and he picked me up and, um, he, You know, he was, I I say this because I want my daughters to hear this one day. Like he, I attributed like a lot of the qualities that made our marriage not work to him being romantic, to him uh, taking charge, to him um, being invested in me. But like, if I were to look at it with adult perspective and to be fair, adult experience in relationships and intimacy with men and women, I would have seen that. You know, it was fairly controlling. It was fairly asymmetrical. You know, like I think back on that night because we got engaged that night. So he picked me up to go camping. I had wanted to go to a party. I had kind of gotten like dressed cute. And then we were going to go camping at Sycamore Cove up in Malibu. It's a beautiful, beautiful spot. And we were walking along the beach and it was the moon was out. It was dark. It was beautiful, Malibu. And he, was walking with me and I said, this is such a perfect night. And he like kneeled down right there on the sand and like pulled a ring out and said, the only thing that could make this night more perfect is if you agree to marry me. Mm. And in that moment, I was shocked because it was, there had been, it was, I mean, we were, we were Mormon and we'd been dating for three months. So like, it's not like what, you know, but we hadn't really talked about it practically and we hadn't really, um, we hadn't picked out a ring. You know what I mean? Like there was no, it was just, it was kind of one-sided, but mm-hmm. I was totally into him. And we had this great sexual chemistry and 
um, I didn't even say yes at first. I just said, oh my gosh, are you serious? And like, I was just kind of like gobsmacked. And he said, are you going to say yes? And I said, yes, yes, of course, yes. You know, and then I like kissed him and we went back into the tent and we slept and, you know, we made out and then we woke up the next day and the ring was a little small and so I couldn't wear it. Um, and I also was like, I don't want to lose it. And I, but also putting it on, there was just something going on with me. Like, I just wasn't like, oh my gosh, you know, I just mm -hmm. didn't feel that. And I, so I immediately spun it and said, you know, everyone's so crazy in the ward. They're going to be over, like, everyone's going to freak out and it's going to take away the sacredness of this engagement, of the commitment we're making, of how important this is. So I don't want to tell anyone. I want to keep it secret for us so we can have it and keep, sorry, we can have it and keep it precious for us. And I remember saying those words, but really what I was saying is like, I need to work through, I haven't even considered if this is what I want because all it, all that matters is that it's happening. You know what I mean? You're so focused on it. Ha like, I have to order the steak. And then you're like, do I want steak? And the, mm -hmm. it's delivered. And you're like, wait, I haven't even checked in with myself, really. It's happened so fast. I've been working so hard to be a desirable person. Now he's asked me to marry him. And I have to kind of look at this with eyes wide open. And that was terrifying to me. And so I went home and I put the ring in my top drawer and I didn't wear it. And I didn't tell anyone. And I spun it to him that I was keeping it sacred and private. And I just wanted to give it time and work out the details first so that the wedding didn't become bigger than the commitment we were making. And these were the types of things I would say. And these were lies. I didn't even know they were lies. I was too young and too inexperienced and too thirsty for marriage and too thirsty for to be established and too thirsty to be, to begin my life. I was sick of being defensive and making excuses and kind of like pretending to have big aspirations, you know, because I, I would have, if that had been an option, but it really, I just, I was waiting to get married and that was my whole purpose in life. So Somehow my roommate found out or she found the ring. She was looking for socks or something, found the ring. It's like, are you and Billy engaged? And she uh, made me put the ring on. Another friend came over and they were just like, you're being crazy. You're going to lose him. You're going to blah, you know, and they just kind of came at me. He got kind of irritated that I wasn't wearing the ring. He went on a trip um, and came back, you know, and like was just like, we're either doing this right or we're not doing it at all. And that, of course, you know curled my toes. Anytime a man is like authoritative or demanding or like, it's, it's we're doing this right. I'm going to take us to heaven. You know, I just mm -hmm. was like, it, it, it was deeply implanted in me that this is masculinity. This is protection. This is someone that will provide. This is someone that will get me to heaven. And it, there was, um, instead of it being like, this is someone like back off, buddy. I might need all the time in the world. I, that never even occurred to me. I felt it internally, but I couldn't articulate it. And I immediately suppressed it because that was going to get me nowhere. I had to make this work because this is probably my only shot and it might be my last shot. And nobody that checked all the boxes was going to come along. So he independently decided to serve a mission. His family had only been really active for a few years. He was in Texas at the time. And he decided to serve his mission, to go on a mission, but his parents were like in Switzerland the weekend that his farewell was supposed to happen. And so he didn't really have a farewell. He got called to serve um, in Japan and he went into the MTC, just kind of like an independent orphan, you know, in the church. Like mm -hmm. he, he did a lot of it his own. He didn't feel a lot of pressure at all from his family or from his ward. It was, and I thought that was so noble. And just yeah, that kind of, can be a really mm -hmm. good sign. Yeah, I thought, Somebody oh, this guy's a go-getter. Yeah, yeah, and, he's, yeah. and then he was in the MTC for, a, I think, maybe one or two weeks, and he hated the confinement. He hated the routine of the MTC. He hated the, um, what would the word? He just hated the MTC, and he wanted to get out. And I think that's maybe when his parents were in Switzerland, and he called and said, you know, I'm not, I don't want to. I can't stay another day in here under these rules and this confinement and the routine of it all and the structure of it all. He hated. And so they got him out the next day and got him in the mission field serving in Provo, Utah. 
And he left, he went in Provo and he was in Provo for, I think, two or three weeks and he loved it. So happy. He was in a three, a three, uh, three-way. Three three I'm like, how do, yeah. what? <laughs> a three-way. He was in a threesome and he loved it. And then he got called to Kirk, Kirtland, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, I mean, and of course I'm hearing the story and I'm just thinking, I would have much rather married a guy that served a mission in Japan. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. And that's a status mission. That's a rich mission. That's a cool mission. Mm -hmm. You're going to learn Japanese. You're going to be mm -hmm. a huge a businessman. Mm -hmm. You know, they've, they've got, they've, they've charted your path mm -hmm. and they are just rolling out the carpet and you are messing it up. Mm -hmm. And PS, you're going to Provo and now Kirtland, Ohio, mm -hmm. like you right. chose poorly, <laughs> you know, yeah. like this was not, and there was some, and I kind of thought that was, but then I was impressed that he loved Provo. And then I was impressed that he loved Kirtland and he kind of did audio tapes of, I've had some great, this is what he would have said. Like if, when I listened to the tapes, it was like, I've had some great experiences, but I feel like I'm really needed at home in the mission field, in my family, in it, with my, um, at, at, in my university, I need to further my studies and like God has used me here, but I can be much more effective at home. And I'm going to make this decision of sound mind. And he was saying all this. And I listened to the tapes. And I listened with, mm. if I had listened with my personality without him being the only candidate for marriage, I would have been like, this kid's entitled. This kid's parents should have doubled down and been like, you're not coming home. There is no coming home. And we'll see you in two years. And you'll learn more in your commitment and in your tenacity and in your ability to double down than you will, you know, in us indulging you because you don't, you're not enjoying it. But this was the man I was going to marry and this is his narrative. So I had to find the jewels in the rubble. And I'm saying this cruelly now because, you know, we have been divorced for five years and it is ruined my entire life in so many ways that I can look back and say this cruelly. But at the time, you know, I wanted to champion him. I wanted to champion the underdog. I knew I was going to have to spin it for my parents. I knew it wasn't going to be easy, but I knew there was enough good for them to overlook these big things. If he had didn't have an education, didn't have a family with money, didn't have his own career, wasn't independently wealthy. And I had said he had come home from his mission. He, we didn't know, he didn't know what he wanted to do with his life and we were getting married. My parents would have been like, we're sending you away, you know, mm -hmm. but there was enough on the other side of the fence that made it palatable. So my dad, I remember we were in Laguna beach. He had come and met Billy and they were just like, are you sure he even likes you? And they weren't feeling him. They just weren't into it. And I esteemed like his inability to kind of like perform for my parents, you know, cause there, there were, he had roommates that came and were just charming everybody, but he was kind of reserved and a little uppity. And I, that turned me on because he's, he doesn't try and that's sexy because more authentic or at least it can, yeah, it's, it can I, I read more it authentic. as authentic. Yeah. I read it as yeah his own man, true blue, uh, his own person, an, an individual with strength that I wouldn't be able to steamroller, you know, that would um, teach me and guide me and be a support to me. So I just kind of saw it as all that. I, this is probably totally too much information. But uh, my dad said, you know, this is a red flag. And I said, you know what, dad? Oh my gosh, I like remember this moment so clearly. Tissues. I just I've said, you know what, Dad? Money. I, Billy went on his mission. He didn't have to go. He chose to go. He set an example for his family. He didn't even have a farewell. Because this is back in the era where, like, you had a farewell. And it was mm -hmm. like your GD, you know, quinceanera. Yeah. You know, yeah. this is like, this is happening. It was a bar mitzvah for a 19-year-old boy. And there were flag cookies and, you know, people lining up outside the church. I mean, that was when we had the big, huge things. And he was from this big family and from Texas. So in Texas, you know, like you're going to, it's a big deal. It's not like just every week there's a farewell, like when I was at Olympus or graduated. So I was like, he did this on his own, no farewell. And he still went on a mission because a lot of guys, and you know, yeah. we went on missions because we needed the big party. And then there was such a huge send off mm -hmm. that you weren't going to come back sheepish, you know, and return all the checks and return all the money and all the 
you know, Books of Mormon with your name engraved. So he said, and he often said to me, you know, I think that if I had had a big farewell, I might have felt um, more embarrassed to come home. Mm. But I'm like, so he he went on his own. He felt like he could be of more service in the at home. So he came home and he was at church the next Sunday, not because his parents were there and he needed to go, not for any other reason that he just did. He just followed the rules. And so I was like, okay, this, he's re- the real deal. He's not just doing this for show. He doesn't have a closet porn addiction. He doesn't, you know, he's not, you know, hiding deep, dark secrets. He's just shows up and does it. And I felt safe. That made me feel safe. And I said to my dad, I know who he is because he, I literally said these words, he has already walked through trials in his life mm. and he has chose continually chosen the gospel. And that it demonstrates how insulated my worldview was. I thought having a less active family who was sealed in the temple, wealthy and white, was a trial. Hmm. I thought getting the general authorities to switch your mission with a phone call twice and coming home and still going to church was like he had overcome a trial. <laughs> I thought that he had proven his medal. Hmm. And so I was marrying someone that had been through the refiner's fire, you know, and was going to continually choose the gospel when faced with adversity. Mm -hmm. And that is what I told my dad and I told my mom and I said, mom, we have total sexual chemistry and we'll never want for anything. We're, I'm going to be financial, you know, I'm going to support him. We're financial. He's rich. We're going to be financially independent. I mean, we never would say he's rich, but like he's financially independent and wealthy and we're going to be able to do great things. And my mom said, well, there's no doubt that Greece is the skids. You know, she said that term and I, they were worried though. They were worried and they were right to be worried, but it didn't matter because I was marrying a rich, handsome, cool, I mean, he is a return missionary. <laughs> return missionary. There you go. Can, can I share just three thoughts really yeah. quickly? Um, so th- there's three big things that came up for me uh, listening to you tell the story. One is that when you're married as a Mormon, it is a, it's a spiritual and a psychological threesome in the sense that it's you and your spouse and the church or you and your spouse and the Savior. And so it, it really isn't two people fully connected. It's, and even you, you're judging him by his relationship to the gospel. And so it's, and I think that there's some stability that can come with that, but, the, but it also can, can eliminate some of the real connection and intimacy because it's three instead of two. Does that make sense? Absolutely. But also you're judging him by how much he's conforming to the, the way you've been taught he should as a priesthood holder. So there's something, you don't always marry each other. You kind of like, do they check the boxes? Do they check the Mormon boxes? And then it's a th- it's a threesome. It's a psychological and emotional threesome because it's always, are we living the gospel? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That takes me to the second point, which is that it's like a train because you're, you're 23, you're feeling like you're timing out. You weren't able to find that spouse at BYU. You, you went on the mission because that's what unmarried women do when they're 21 and unmarried, you know, back, back then. And even now they're a little younger, but, but you got to hurry and find somebody. And so it's like, okay, he checks the boxes. We've only known each other three months and you're getting engaged after three months. And then all the momentum kicks in and your parents had some pause because they don't want a big mess on their hands, but socially around you, it's like, you got to do this. You got to do this. And psychologically. So like, once you get on the train, the train just kind of sweeps you away. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the second thing is like the the momentum and the inertia is so strong. We don't take the time to like date for a long time and then move in together and then live together for a while. Are we emotionally compatible? Are we sexually compatible? Are we best friends? It's like, nope, they check the boxes and we got to have sex, but we can't have sex till we're married. Let's get engaged. And then, and, and so it becomes like a train. And I, I'm going to guess that what you're going to, you're going to resonate with this idea that you just got swept up in the train. Yeah. Um, 
uh, and, and I think and I a, was shoveling coal yeah, to yeah, keep you it going. You you know? to be, yeah. I was suppressing anything that was going to derail us. Yeah, I was keeping my mouth shut. I was spinning the narrative so that it was palatable to friends, family, and exactly. to my own psyche. And that's the third point I want to make because, you know, there's a there's an element of, of Real Housewives that that I think of as brand management, where all of you guys kind of have a brand, and you all have side businesses, and there's. When you're a help meet to a, a priesthood holder as a Mormon woman, it almost feels like your job is to manage his brand. Absolutely. And it feels mm-hmm. like you were yeah. you were his co-brand manager. Yeah. And I'm gonna I, I'm anticip mm-hmm. I'm anticipating in the story that a lot of your marriage and even after is gonna be how to handle his brand. You 100%. know what I mean? Because you your brand is his brand. Yeah, I'm white labeled. <laughs> What do you mean by that? Well, like, he's the substance, and I'm just putting whatever label on it that he wants to sell, you know? So it's like, I, I'm not manufacturing anything with him. I'm just coming in and managing the brand. And I don't want to be reductionist, because I'm sure there's much more to it than that. But, like, you're already trying to convince your parents that he's a good guy. You're trying to convince yourself that he's a good guy. And then he's the front. And then your job is to, like, have the kids, take care of the home, and help manage his brand. Because you're powerless, Totally powerless. You're, you're powerless. It's his money, right? And you're, you're powerless. Okay. Sorry, I just had to... I just... No, that's absolutely correct. It was... I was covenanting, covenanting to this man. He was covenanting to me, but we were both covenanting to God. So we're making these covenants. And it made who I chose in this triangle much less significant because God was part of our marriage. God. Yeah. All-powerful, mm-hmm. omniscient, omnipotent, God of heaven and earth was the third party to this marriage. I could have failed. So if he had a willing heart and living the principles, and I had a willing heart and living the principles, everything else was gravy and irrelevant. And and I've it was the gospel that forced me to be humble and not marry the AP. You know, it was me saying, listen, check yourself, be thou humble. That's pride. You know, yeah, like you are you are getting the real deal. You're not marrying this, you know, the check boxes, although I was, you're getting the real deal. A guy that's proven himself that yeah. is loves the gospel regardless that that makes hard choices without fear of repercussions. Like it's a hard choice to stand up and come home from a mission. There is a stigma attached. Mm-hmm. And he seemed oblivious to that stigma and instead of it being obtuseness, I saw it as humility. And he's guileless and he's earnest Mm -hmm. and he's devout and it doesn't matter what might not work because if you're in a partnership with God, he makes up for all of that. And I hear more, I hear a lot of Mormons, not all Mormons, but I hear a lot of Mormons saying marriage is for eternity. You find someone, you make the best of it. And Mm -hmm. I had found someone. So you make the best of it. And how can it fail? God's a part of it. And I was explicitly taught, I don't know if you guys were, I was explicitly taught any two people can make a marriage work if they live the gospel. Absolutely. Any two people. It doesn't matter. Absolutely. Any two people can. Yeah. Heard it my whole life and not only heard it and internalized that, but like I knew my own abilities as a human being. I had seen my success on my mission. I had seen my success at BYU, you know, academically and entrepreneurial wise, I had seen my success at my current job when I met him. I mean, I was a a shooting star. Like the vice president spent 20 minutes talking to me about something dumb. And he's like, why are you in this department? You're working with me. And I was traveling to New York like the next week. Like I knew that I had skills. And so I could marry anybody and make it work. Mm-hmm. I yeah. love sex. I yeah. love men. I love the gospel. Yeah. And I like, if you like me, all that I needed is for you to like me and to buy into it. Yeah. And he seemed to. Yeah. So I was very confident in my ability to endure to the end. And I thought the one thing that might mess up that pick someone and make it work is sexual incompatibility because it's pretty weird for us as Mormons, you know, like so Mm -hmm. much shame, really very little sexual experience. The sexual experience I had was with, you know, me with boys like that were normal pursuing me and being like, no, you know, like this whole coy game. And, but I, and I 
you know, was so attracted to him. Like we had, you know, there was a f- total physical chemistry with us. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, oh, I'm golden. Yeah. I'm golden. I, this is, you know, this is going to be easy. And, um, so I powered through. Yeah. Okay. So how did it, I'm dying to know what, what happens next. So. Well, we got married and we went on our honeymoon. So what temple? We got married in the Laie temple on Oahu. Hawaii. Hawaii. Yeah, we were the only wedding that week, which added to my superiority that I wasn't like, I had gone to my cattle call friends' weddings in the Salt Lake Temple where there were seven brides in that room. And we were like putting together and pinning the garments so they didn't show. And the whole ritual of just like the bevy of cackling hens around the bride and <laughs> getting her out the side door with all of her family and friends and getting him out. And then we cheer and they're going to, if they have three hours before the reception, they're going to go have sex because they finally get to have sex. Ah. <laughs> and we that weird ritual that is, it just seemed to me like, I used to think it was so barbaric that like, um, kind of like red tent, you know, Persian cultures would like hold the sheet out to prove that she had been a virgin and there was blood on the sheet and she was pure, you know, mm. that kind of like ancient custom. Mm-hmm. And I would always laugh about it because it was like we were doing that just in a subdued way, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it was just so much hype around the consecration of the marriage Mm -hmm. that you're finally getting to have sex. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just had no concept of like sexual intimacy aside from just hours and hours and hours of foreplay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which I was great at. Mm -hmm. You (laughs) You know what I mean? I don't know how else to say it. Like, it's different than being in a long term living together sexual relationship with someone, you know, which I never have had. Mm -hmm. So I don't even really know what that would be like, but I know that it's different than what I it's. I know that I don't want that for my daughters. I do not want that for my daughters because what I think happened is there's a lot of hype, a lot of buildup, a lot of the train moving toward the station. We get married, we have sex. It's great. So it wasn't a disaster. No, not Good. at all. Some people have disasters. So you Yeah. Didn't. And it was not a disaster. I mean, it was like, you know, I it was baptism by fire, you know, because I suddenly was trying to be adventurous and crazy and I was just like, I didn't understand the mechanics of all of it. Mm-hmm. So and I couldn't talk about it or say, well, sex in the shower hurts, you know what I mean? Or like mm-hmm. I was I just couldn't I just had to be like, Oh, I'm up for anything and I'm I love sex and I did, I loved sex and I loved that. But there was, it was almost like there was for sure a letdown after we got married. Hmm. It was like build up, build up, build up three days of bliss. And then it's like, now what do we do? Mm -hmm. Now we've done it. Now we're married. Now nobody gives two shits. (laughs) You know what I mean? And it was just kind of like your life was now on this different. I was now on the train and I didn't know the destination. And I had to really look at who we had, you know, what we had both done. And I think we were probably both under that same pressure to make it happen, make it work. And so at our wedding dinner, um, his uncle got up, he's passed on and it was so sweet. He said, you know what they say before you get married, keep your eyes wide open Mm -hmm. after you get married, keep your eyes half closed. Mm -hmm. And he made some sweet comment, but like you married such a beautiful woman, Billy, I would, I would say to you, keep your eyes wide open because she's a catch and she's beautiful. And we Mm -hmm. all laughed and we shared scriptures at our wedding dinner. And it was this beautiful glass gazebo overlooking the Pacific ocean, you know, turtle Bay. And I had selected a scripture to read. Everyone had like a quote or a scripture my mom had compiled and we all, it was this intimate, beautiful dinner. And I read the scripture from Ruth, Mm -hmm. you know, whither thou goest, I will go. Mm -hmm. Thy people will be my people, you know, and I will, I basically declared at my wedding reception that I was, I was enveloping myself into him and his clan and his family and his life and his, him as my help me. It's a scripture about devotion. About devotion. Complete devotion. Leaving Life your culture, life. leaving your people, and doing everything in a, in the spirit of service. And I was willing to do that. And I wanted to do that. Mm-hmm. And I had my best friend sing um, the song, 
in my life by Bette Midler, you know, and it's like of all the people and places I've been to and all the experiences I've had, none of them, they all fail in comparison to the ability to, you know, be in love with, to be loved by you and to be your wife. Mm. And I, cause I felt grief getting married. I did. I felt grief because I knew what I was prepared to do and I was walking into it willingly. I didn't know. I mean, as willingly as you can, when people have told you it's all that's important, it's all that matters. It doesn't matter who it is with, but you just make it work. And you've been successful in every other aspect of Mormonism. I was like, you know, I had traveled, I had had experiences, I had loved other men, you know, that were not Mormon on that level. And I was giving all of that up to be a mother and a wife. And I acknowledged it. She sang that song, you know? And I don't know if you guys know the lyrics of that song. Yeah, but you... that my parents, that's their song too, the Beatles version though. Oh, it's the Beatles. Okay, yeah. Because yeah. mm-hmm. there's Beth Midler from For the Boys and then Beatles. Did the Beatles write it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's mm-hmm. a Beatles Sorry, song. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's great. Bette Midler, man. Yeah. <laughs> but it's an it's a incredibly meaningful song. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I um, I was... That's one of my songs with Margie too. Really? Yes. I'm a huge Beatles fan, yeah. Guys, why didn't she tell me his Beatles? I said Bette Miller like seven times. Well, she redid it. She redid it. Yeah. I wasn't sure if there was another. I wasn't sure if there was another song I didn't know about. No, it's because I. I think I had listened to it for, and I had a girl singing it. So I. Mm-hmm. I mean, my friend sang it, and it was um, totally meaningful to me. So I knew what I was doing. I was willing to do it, and I was excited to do it, and I was going to be the best goddamn wife <laughs> he had ever seen or known, yeah. and people were going to be blown away because I was going to love this man. And I was going to raise an empowered, beautiful, successful family. And my mom had done it with six kids. Yeah. I knew what it took. And I was down. Let me ask you, I th- I have this sense that when a Mormon couple gets married, either explicitly or not explicitly, there's an understanding of how life's going to go. It's kind of the train concept. Mm-hmm. But like there are the check boxes of what's going to happen in our marriage and what our life is going to be like. Do you mind ticking those off of like how you imagine you both dreamed your life was going to proceed and, and what the check boxes were going to be, you know, in terms of how, what yeah. your day-to-day. It's so hard because it's, you know, I, it's so hard to go back to that space because, you know, now my eyes have been opened. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? But I. But there's like a church every week. And, yeah, you know. absolutely. Church every week. We had traveled. He did not surf or get in the swim on no Sundays. Swimming on Sunday. No swimming on Sundays. That was a hard and fast Satan, rule. Because Satan has control of the waters on Sunday. Yeah. Right. And he, but he was pretty cool about like a restaurant on Sunday, you know, if we were traveling, but like didn't like to break the Sabbath. So I just felt like. We are going to live in California. We are going to be ridiculously wealthy. We are going to travel the world. We are going to be cool Mormons that attend church every week. I am going to have every calling and perform it well. He is going to be, uh, you know, the guy that shows up and sets up the chairs and collapses the chairs and doesn't need a lot of fanfare and will probably get called to a position and will just be I'm like, okay, you know, because he seemed so go with the flow and so easy. He'll be bishop and not want to be bishop, not right. aspire mm-hmm. to be he'll bishop. He'll be reluctant but... bishop and he'll be reluctant <laughs> bishop because he's good looking and he's wealthy and he's righteous mm-hmm. because that's the dream, Yeah, you know? Temple and, attendance, would you, would you guys be a, um, in your dream? Would in you my dream, been... Ward Temple night for sure. So go probably, to the temple once probably a couple of months, you know, every couple of months go with our best friends, a group of six of us, probably not go weekly unless we we're thinking about having a baby <laughs> or thinking about a career change. Then we would go together and sit in the cluster room. What about garments? Garments. Absolutely. So tell them what that means. Well, the garments, you know, you would wear them anytime that you're not swimming or having sex, which yeah. was his MO. Mm-hmm. And I was going to wear garments always. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, I wouldn't, I was going to do everything. I was going to make sure that there was nothing he could say I wasn't doing. Pray together. Family prayer. Yeah. Oh, I forgot that we did. We prayed together when we were dating. We prayed together after a fight and I thought, Oh my gosh, I've never been able to be this intimate with a man and pray. Yeah. And it's so much better and so much more important. Yeah. And this is, this is it. Mm-hmm. Cause I didn't really have experience with Mormon guys unless they were bad Mormons and I was like trying to help them, you know? Right. <laughs> How many kids would, would you have wanted at that time? Um, 
You wanted a big family, didn't you? Yeah. I mean, I hadn't had a kid yet, Mm -hmm. so I didn't know. And I was trying to be really thoughtful about it. But truth is, I would have had eight. Eight kids? I would have had as many kids as we could support and that we could handle. And I guess I was kind of seeing what kind of dad he would be. And if our kids were cute, if our Mm -hmm. kids worked out, like I didn't know if I would have kids with special needs, kids that need, you know, required if I could get pregnant. I had Mm -hmm. all these fears because none of it had been, I hadn't put any of it to the test, hadn't gotten genetic testing. I didn't know what my fertility rates were, if he could get me pregnant. And so I, I was careful to gate, you know, gauge my expectations, but yeah, I would have had as many, I would have had babies until I couldn't have babies. Yeah, and then when you're old, serve missions together, right? Serve Mormon serve missions. Serve Mormon missions. Just be mission beautiful, president, wealthy, mission kind wife. people that mm-hmm. invite everyone over, and we're missionaries because we are superior, and you can come in our home and feel the spirit, and you can have this too. Mm. You can have this too. And, like and, role models. Yeah. Role models. Absolutely, and yeah. I was down for it. And so we got married, and kind of the reality of being married to each other settled in. We had never lived together. We had... We had kind of normal things come up. Like he was an entrepreneur, but he now was living in Huntington Beach. He had been doing snowmobiling videos. So he wasn't in an area to really continue to do that because he would have had to go back to Utah. I was working full time and into my business. And I think that immediate dynamic of him being kind of unemployed, you know, it's Mm -hmm. like not unemployed, but there's so much pressure on him to like get up be at an office for eight hours, you know, and he was young and from a very successful family. And I think that that weighed on him. And I think I for sure was um, a false friend to him in that aspect. I pretended to be supportive, like, take your time, figure out what you want to do. Let's start a business. Let's do all these things. But like, end of the day, buddy, you're paying the bills. I'm doing this now. And I'm going to pretend like I'm into doing it. I'm going to pretend like I'm a partner. I'm a companion. But like, I was like, bring home the bacon, mm-hmm. bring home the bacon, because yeah. that's the deal. That's the deal. That's the deal. And I was, I loved, I loved my job, but it didn't matter. Yeah. And then, um, we waited like, cause he was still kind of in between careers, figuring things out and we never hurt, hurt for money at all. You know, we were living the high life. We were traveling to Florida and, you know, he was flying private. I mean, we had money and we had a great life. His parents supported. Yeah. I mean, his parents, they didn't, he didn't, it wasn't like he was on the dole, but when there's, we were just had a great lifestyle because, you know, his, the company would come in town and rent 10 rooms and everyone got Disneyland passes for three days. You know what I mean? Just kind of perks, perks, perks and fun family experiences. And we'd all fly to Florida for Thanksgiving. We'd all fly to Hawaii for grandma's 80th birthday, you know, just kind of, you really can supplement the yeah. daily doldrums of life with like these big paid for all expense paid experiences. Mm-hmm. And he bought me a Porsche, which Holy. I was a car girl. 911? 911. It was, well, it was a restored 1978 Porsche Carrera 911 with a huge whale tail, bright Whoa. red, cherry red. Nice. Um, as newlyweds. As newlyweds. Oh, like I, he paid off all my student loans. He bought me a Porsche. He was just all these like erotic things to me, you know, like being cared for. And I was still, wor- I was the one working, but like it just, there was something specific to me about that, that I regret. Um, I regret the lip service that I paid him. I regret not feeling truly like I will work and I love to work and I'm good at it. And I am not ashamed about it, but there was shame. Oh, you're married. Oh, you're still working full time. Well, what does he do? Mm -hmm. When are you going to have babies? Every single bishop, you know, we are in the Huntington Beach Seventh Ward. When are am I going to see you with a baby? Mm. And the truth was, I was kind of waiting for Billy to be like, "I want a baby with you so bad." Like I was waiting for that romantic shift. But he was in the throes of figuring out his career. He now had a wife. He now had this responsibility. I was a go getter. I was, you know, had leadership callings in our ward. I was friends with every, you know what I mean? I kind of started to see how I was kind of eclipsing or emasculating him. Mm -hmm. And I leaned into it because I wanted to emasculate him because Mm. I wanted him to step up. Mm. And I mean, I didn't realize that then I am saying this now with like, of course, knowing that our marriage failed Mm -hmm. and the things that I should have done differently and the things that I did because I was indoctrinated to Mm -hmm. do them. Mm -hmm. And I also thought that it was, it was my righteous um, 
what's that called when you like have righteous indignation, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. like I, I didn't consciously emasculate him, but I was, I was playing at my success, playing at my callings, playing at my friendships. And he was, it was, and then the recession hit, it was 2000. One, you know, was, we had 9-11. We'd been in New York two weeks before 9-11. We were a mm. picture of us on the top of the World Trade Towers. Oh, wow. Like on our fridge when 9-11 happened and then the economy kind of crashed. You moved to New York? No, we were just, oh, just visiting. visiting. We just okay. traveled, you know, yeah. we traveled yeah. and did whatever we wanted and we had a great life. And um, 9-11 happened. He had, was doing a couple different little side businesses that were moderately successful. You know, he's just, he was a serial entrepreneur and I was super into it. I was a help meet. I loved it. I doubled down. I supported him, but I didn't really have a, much of a voice. Mm-hmm. And the sad thing was, is I, I really fell into that role of like the wife that just like whispers, like, you should do this or honey, you know, like when mm-hmm. they grab and then, yeah. and he's like, I think that sounds wonderful. And he thinks it's his idea. Mm-hmm. And I kind of e- eclipsed from the equation. That happened all the time. And I was fine with it. Yeah. I mean, at the time, because as long as things were getting done. and But I did kind of think like, I could run this. You know, like you made, I said, choose blue. And you totally chose red. And blue selling two to one. You know, so mm-hmm. I recognized that I didn't have a voice. But he respected me on some level, but not completely. Anyway, um, it just really became very, very difficult. And then... We got to that point where, you know, I'm just going to say it. This is horrible. Forgive me, daughters and Billy. But, like, I knew I had to get pregnant to make something happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because he was he was just frittering around. We had mm-hmm. money. We There was no rock bottom. There was no yeah. hard point. And a baby was going to just, let's just get this going. You know, we've been married two years. Kick it to the next level. Kick it to the next level. I went off the pill. Not a big discussion. I think I probably told him it could take a year. Mm. I got pregnant that month. Mm. I was really sick, really pregnant. He had been working at a startup and had started a couple of businesses. Those startups failed. He went to work one day. The doors were chained, you know, just kind of things like that. So we started consulting for his dad. And then it became clear that if he was going to support a family and I was going to quit working with this impending baby being born, that he was going to have to go back and work for the family company. Which was what type of company? It was a vitamin and mineral company. It's called Nutraceutical. It was headquartered in Park City, and it was a huge company, and he had worked there before, and he had not really enjoyed it because he wanted to be his own man and a free spirit and all of these things that I thought were so attractive and so cool. But I also was well aware that he had a golden parachute. And it's it's romantic and cool to be married to an entrepreneur when you know that there's no bottom you know, you know that there's, mm-hmm. you can always go back to the family business and, and be provided for. So I started to have to own a lot of my lip service. You know, I wasn't a free spirit. I wanted a nine to five husband with a paycheck and perks and jazz tickets and fam, you know, and business vacations and status and an office and a suit. And I wanted to have all of the spoils of life. And I wanted to have babies and dress them and have big parties and, you know, cute crafts for my young women. Like I wanted it all. And I had a very specific picture of what it looked like. I never asked for it and I never said it out loud. And I deeply regret that. Why? Because it was dishonest and it was manipulative and it made me become a person that I didn't recognize. And it also eroded what could have been true intimacy between us. What was manipulative and dishonest? To lie and say, I'll live in a trailer and support you while you write your novel. I see. Yeah. Which I said emphatically, you, you have a dream and I will, I will commit to that dream. I don't need anything. Mm -hmm. I just need you and I need you to commit to it and I will love you through it. And I would say those things because I could say those things because I knew we were never going to live in a van down by the river. Yeah. His family wouldn't have allowed it. My family wouldn't have allowed it. Yeah. So I could be romantic and I could say these things, but it was not how, it was how I wanted to feel. Mm -hmm. It was how I wanted to live, but it's not how I truly was programmed to live. (laughs) Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. Completely makes sense. Yep. So I regret that. And you're I, not the only one that says things like that. Yeah. I mean, I think we all do. Mm-hmm. There's this there's this idealized version of love that's unconditional love, and we're devoted to each other no matter what through 
better for worse in sickness and in health yeah. till death do his part. Two oaks and yoked together yeah. and I'm his partner and he respects me and I respect <clears throat> him. And like, I just wanted to. Yeah, you, have, you were on the train. Well, let's face it. You, you grew up on the train and you wanted to get back on the train and he needed to do his role because everybody's got their role on the train. Yeah. And, and so I knew where this train was going. It was going to, you know, it was going to a life of happiness yeah. and it was going to eternal it's glory the and the new and everlasting covenant of our own planets and our own babies. And, and I, and I just wasn't ever honest with myself and in turn was not ever honest with him. And that crack and that fissure eroded my own identity and in turn emasculated mm -hmm. and eroded his and our marriage became very strained and we never really talked about it. And I'll just throw in that that you get disconnected from yourself because you're not your your job isn't to plug into what you care about and what really no, makes you happy and what really opposite, right? No, your job <laughs> is to is to get comfortable being on the train. And your job isn't to really get to know each other and really have this deep connection. It's to do whatever that third party in your marriage wants you to be doing. So you don't ever really learn to know yourself. You don't ever really get to see your other partner, your partner, and you don't ever get to build a life that's really authentic to you. Yeah. So you really are set up for failure if the goal is fulfillment and emotional intimacy. Instead, you're set up to either survive because you are just both able to stay on the train and go where the train's taking you, or you become so miserable where the whole dream falls apart. But it was never about either of you as individuals, and it was never never about your relationship. It was about what what the train wants and where the train's taking you, and it's a, it's it's a setup if you really want what I think we all really desire, which is to be to know ourselves and to be seen, and to have true deep emotional intimacy. That that's not how that's not where the train's going. <laughs> that's not what the train's designed for. It's actually designed to suppress those things. Yeah. If you want to stay on the train, couple. you have to suppress you have it. To. You have to. So it's and, a setup. Yeah. And I'm not saying it's nefarious. There are people with good marriages in the church. I don't think the church leaders mean this. But but marriages in Mormonism are not constructed for self-knowledge and awareness. You got to get divorced to have that, <laughs> right? And, and they're not for true emotional connection and intimacy. It's for getting on the train and... And, and going where the train takes you. That, that's it. So yeah. it's a setup. Mm -hmm. it's a setup. You're not alone. Yeah, and, and it's and every I, marriage there is. And it's it, every Mormon marriage. It didn't, it, yeah. And I just, I wasn't ever going to dig deep. I was never going to be totally authentic or honest about it because that would serve no one. Yeah. And yeah. yes, I'd been really internalized that my authentic, intimate self was, you know, contrary to God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. You know? Yeah. Flawed. Flawed because natural men's desire, you know, yeah. the natural man is an enemy to God and will ever, forever be. So I didn't want to like, be like, what do you really feel? Yeah. You know, and I had one well, moment where I called my mom and Billy was kind of going through some depression and just kind of trying to figure things out. And it was unattractive to me and it was also burdensome and we were quarreling and it was like, I just kind of fell into that role of just like, figure it out, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Like oh, yeah. first world problems, yeah. which million dollar company do you want to start today? You know, and that's, and I was, I was patronizing and I was dismissive of a lot of his needs and I didn't even know they were now, but I can look back and own that and think how hard that must've been for him if we could have even talked about it. And I, um, I called my mom and I just said, this sucks, you know? And she said, well, welcome to the club. Yeah. Just laughed, just totally laughed, was unfazed. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Didn't say fly home. It's like let they're me, having fun. Let me come out there. And she just said, oh, join the club. And I said, <laughs> and I said, well, I don't want to do it. And she's like, well, tough, tough luck, kid. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're, you're in it now. And I said, well, no, I can get divorced. And I had never said that out loud. And we were in, like, we were maybe three, four months in. It was still in that figuring things out, we had to move in together. Like all of a sudden I'm living with a man, you know, it's just a lot of hard things. And, <laughs> and, um, yeah, she was... said, well, my mom scoffed and she said, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, you can't, no, you can't. Yeah. So settle in. Yeah. And I think back and I used to think, mom, why didn't she, if my daughter called me and said that I would be like, 
you absolutely can get divorced. I'll send you a ticket, fly home and spend the weekend here. You know, like Mm -hmm. whatever it is right now, I'm not going to, I'm not going to downplay it because the fact that you're feeling anything is a chance for you to dig in, see what's going on and fix it. But instead, what I had figured out was just, okay, right now you're in a dry, pull the blinds down on the train and just continue forward. You know, don't, so you're going through and you don't like the direction you're going right now. Just don't look, sleep for a while, Mm -hmm. you know, just kind of repress it and not like get in and figure out how it's working, you know, just persevere. Yeah. And that was a pivotal sliding door moment that I was, had not had a child yet. We were barely three months in, we could have walked away Mm -hmm. and I could have denied ever having even been married, except I couldn't because I was sealed in heaven. Mm -hmm. It was, I, you know, (laughs) entered into the new and everlasting covenant with him. He was my eternal spouse. So I understood the magnitude of it, but I just, I remember repressing it. And then I got pregnant. So we moved back to Utah and it was, things were really good for a while because everything was falling right into place. He was working at nine to five. I was having a baby. I had I was decorating, I was cooking, I was getting in, integrated in my ward, I was serving in young women's, and I was I was um, settling into my role. And I wasn't even asking myself why or how or if I was enjoying it because it was irrelevant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was irrelevant. No. It was, you're on the train. You made it, you got to the station, you got on, you got a ticket, you're on it. And it was like the last thing I was going to do is like go talk to the conductor and, and like open up the thing and see how it was oper. You know what I mean? Yeah, that was no. I had no need. Nope. No need. Just hold on. So what happened? I'm dying to know how how you guys um, settled in and what that looked like. So we had a couple great years. Uh, I got pregnant. He went to work at the vitamin company. Uh-huh. He went to work at the vitamin company, and he had he kind of accepted he wasn't thrilled about it because he wanted to be his own man. He didn't want to work for, for his dad, work for the man. He wanted to be a free spirited entrepreneur, but it was hard because the money was great and it was pretty easy. And I don't want to diminish it, but you know. Mm-hmm. And I had my our first daughter, Ashley. She was born in California, but then we moved when she was six months old to Utah. And we moved in. We built a home. We lived in Holiday. Holiday. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah, it's a house that you're in still, yeah, right? I'm still in the same house. What? Yeah. That's swanky mm-hmm. for newlyweds. Yeah, we were we were for sure like had more frills than any of our friends. Mm-hmm. You know, we were we were privileged and we knew we were privileged and we were grateful. Mm-hmm. And we were like, this is awesome. Because in California we had been small fish in a big pond, you know. Mm-hmm. I had a Porsche and we lived in like a town home, but like Everybody had a Porsche. Mm-hmm. Everybody had beach homes. People were upgrading their real estate. I mean, it was just yeah. moving at such a fast pace. And so it was felt good to come home and kind of be a big fish in a little pond where all of our friends were like living in their parents' basements and we're building a house and, you know, I'm buying a BMW and just kind of, just this kind of the frills of it, you know, that mm-hmm. the kind of the things that make it look like picturesque, mm-hmm. ideal. Yeah. And I had, um, I got planned my second pregnancy perfectly so that when my oldest daughter was turning two, she opened up a little present that said, I'm going to be a big sister. And that was a big thrill for the whole family. And I was pregnant with our second daughter and um, everything was going great. And then it just started kind of, the shine started to wear off, you know, and you get right back down to where you're at and you're lacking real connection. I'm forcing him into this role of provider and I am uh, p- pretending to be fulfilled in my role as just a mother. Talk about that. Because one thing I've noticed, and I don't mean this to be like false compliments, I guess. I'm searching for the word. But like I really do think motherhood is the hardest job in the world. Because, you know, as hard as it might be to go work for some company or start some company or survive in the business world, at least you've got lots of different relationships and you're flying places and you're doing cool things and you feel that sense of accomplishment. You're always intellectually challenged, but when you're an intelligent, capable person and you're just home with these babies and these young toddlers running around, it's brutal. It's, it's can be grueling and some people love it, but like Margie was never fully happier at peace. She had like, Great grades, loved studying English literature, ran cross country for BYU, was traveling all over the country, competing in, you know, Stanford and, you know, 
NCAA, and then all of a sudden she's a mommy. You know what I mean? And like wiping noses and Bats. talk. Of, there's a lot of depression with, with with Mormon moms. Talk about how that what that was like for you. Yeah, I um. Or maybe it's different. So I don't mean to put that. No, it's on just you. I'm looking at Dre because it's just it's hard to know what was real and what was projected because my answer would be, I, I can very much, it's, I call it like my beauty pageant answer. Like I don't really know how I really felt about it because it was kind of irrelevant. You were unplugged from yourself. I was, yeah, I was loved being a mom, but I also hated it. And I think the hardest part about being a mom was, um, the shame of not loving it when it was hard. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? Like, like just like the, the gruelingness of it. But I, I will say it's much harder. It's a million times more difficult to be a mom and work almost to the part that point that the fulfillment outside of the home or the money is negated by how much strain it puts on you as a mother to manage the children, to wipe the noses and butts, to be there for them and to be present and not feel absolutely fractured and absolutely stretched to the max. And like, it is much easier to be a stay at home mom as grueling and as menial as the tasks are than it is to do both. And I would say, um, and then just to work and not have children, I think is if you're grown up in the context that we did is, is equally hard because of the shame and the, um, angst mm. of what you're not having. Oh my gosh. That's three super hard options. Yeah. Well, how do you feel about that? No, I agree. I totally agree. I think. Did your happiness go up Dre when you got divorced and you had to go get a job and you had a kid to, or not? Because at least you're pursuing something intellectually challenging. Yeah, I don't know. You know, again, I'm going to kind of say the same thing. I don't remember. I was in survival mode oh, because I was yeah. a single mom. I had yeah. no other choice. I, I've done it again now because I'm obviously a working mom currently. And my self-worth is higher now for sure. Um, but back when I had a small baby and was waiting tables and going to school, I don't think I even considered. You're just survival. Yeah, I was just like, well, God, I, I don't get child support, so I got to pay my bills. How am I going to, you know, provide for me and my daughter? So, it, that's a really complicated question, John. Yeah. Because I and it's one that we've talked about ad nauseum. Like we've discussed <laughs> the subject so much, and I don't know that we have a good answer for you, mm -hmm. because. The hard. shame <laughs> of being a working mom is so real. Mm. However, it does feel really good to have your own money and to have adult interactions and to be recognized for your skills. That feels really, really good. And so does loving your kids. Mm -hmm. That also feels really good. Yeah. So, but the shame of, of not being there hundred percent of the time is also incredibly real. Yeah. yeah. And like in the hierarchy of needs, it's like a first world problem, like my happiness. Well, <laughs> I'm not, that's not on the tape. It's not on the menu mm -hmm. and you don't want it to be because then you have to look at some deep, hard truths right. and you don't want to complicate your life. If you know you're unhappy. Yeah. That's miserable. So and it's better just not even to, just to numb, numb yourself. Yeah. Or just to not consider it, Yeah, you know, to not get upset, just to you know, be grateful. And, and to be fair, it's not just internal, it's comes from our family and our community. Like I was not going to go cry on a shoulder about how I had to do all the childcare when, you know, I have a home and a car and vacations in Hawaii and ski weekends in Deer Valley. And it's like, I'm sorry, what? Whoa. And a cleaning lady and pottery barn sheets. <laughs> like, I'm going to say, well, yeah, he's kind of disengaged with the kids. Like, oh, I'm sorry. There are women. You know what I mean? Like, it just felt like in that hierarchy of needs, like ours were at the bottom and there was nobility in that. Yeah. She who suffers most. She who suffers yeah. most and, and complains the least, the more noble of a woman and wife she is. And I wanted to be a wonderful wife. I didn't want to just be a great wife because I loved him. I wanted him. 
I wanted to be a wonderful woman because that was the metric, a wonderful wife, because that's the metric by which my womanhood was rated and my value in the community and in the ward and in my family and to my Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. That's what mattered. Mm -hmm. And so he was irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And that's so sad. Mm -hmm. And I would never want my daughters to forego emotional intimacy and self-awareness mm. in order mm. to glorify the church and their status in their faith. Mm. That is, and that has taken years and like how many hours of discussion? <laughs> many, many. Yeah. Mm. My husband, I never told him how I really felt because it didn't matter because mm. I was in a marriage with God and him mm-hmm. and I, was having babies and I was doing You're on the train. Yeah, I'm on the train. Well, and truly, Heather, I mean, we've talked about when we first met, you felt sad for me. Like, because we, because I did have, I had that life where I had, you know, found my truth and followed that and you felt bad for me. Right? I felt total pity for you. Hmm. And I felt pity for all women who were doing what I was doing without the os- the umbrella of a husband and membership in the church, because it seemed like if you took away that nobility and that purpose, it seemed futile and menial and sad. Yeah. And I, I mean, that's kind of, we should probably talk about that, how we met, because when we met, I was a married, you know, What's those McLaren stroller okay, so, pushing mm-hmm. mom? <laughs> so how many years into your marriage did you did you guys meet? We met in 2007 or 2008. Uh, they were in kindergarten, so yeah, 2008. We met in 2008. Yeah. I had lived in Utah for five years, and I had, um, th- did I, I had three you, children. You pushed Annabelle in the stroller to school. She was little. Like a baby. Yeah, she was born in 2007. George oh. was born in 2006. So by that time, you're, you're Dre, you're living in Holiday? Uh huh. Yeah, I lived with my mom. Okay. Yeah, when I got divorced, um, my daughter and I moved in with my mom and in Holiday. And our kids went to the same elementary school. So your daughter school. was the same age as her? As her oldest. Oldest. Yeah, so both of oh, our wow. oldest okay. daughters are the same age. Oh, yeah. and you lived just a few minutes apart? Yeah. Uh-huh. They, went to the same, they were in the same class at Oakwood Elementary, and I distinctly remember, and I lived close enough to the school that I would walk to the school with my younger babies and to take Mm -hmm. Ashley to kindergarten. And I would see Dre dropping Elsha off and I would feel so sad for you. Why? Because I felt sad for Elsha and I felt sad for her mom because she had to, I didn't see it as this dedicated mom that's bringing her kindergartner to class and kissing her goodbye and, and scuttling off. I saw her as a single mom that I didn't know the story, but I just knew that, I mean, I don't know how I, I I had to, I just, I figured it out Yeah. because the rest of us went there and walked around and laughed and lunched and volunteered the mom group. She wasn't part of the mom group, but I would see her show up and drop her daughter off and then like walk off. And I remember just like, seeing her walk off and thinking, feeling a sadness because I knew we'd never be friends because I'm a lady of leisure and she's got bills to pay. And those two worlds just don't, you know, cross Mm -hmm. at all. I was in the classroom like every day. And so I would always like take pictures of her daughter at the pumpkin patch or, and I felt like she was Wednesday's child Mm -hmm. because her mom wasn't able to be there. And I didn't know the circumstances of the story, but I probably attributed it to sin and addiction and horrible, you know, things that had happened to her because I didn't know any single moms. And I, I guess I must have known on some level that to do everything we were doing, which was hard and menial and whatever, as a single mom would be like the worst thing I could imagine. Mm. So we noticed each other and I always took a special interest in Elsha and, but I did not have a relationship with Andrea. Mm -mm. So Dre, what's it like living in Salt Lake City in a more, let's just say a more affluent area, one of the more affluent areas in the state, right? Mm -hmm. And you, and you, you've left the church, so you're divorced, you've left the church, 
and then you're a single mom and you're a working single mom, mm-hmm. but then you, you have visibility into these women like Heather and others that are in the you know suburbs and they're, they've got the righteous priesthood holders and they're making lots of money and they're on the train and they're living it. You chose to step off the train. Yeah. But you know that they're probably, I mean, I, I want to know how, I, you know, there's a part of me that's like, well, how did it feel to have Heather just describe that? But that's nothing. Yeah. How does it feel to live that knowing that you're surrounded by people that are probably thinking these thoughts or pointing the finger? It's kind of like Lehi's dream where like there's, there's people pointing, the big and the, spacious the, building, you, know, you know, there's people holding the iron rod and then mm-hmm. there's pointing at the people in the, in the great and spacious building. What's it like to live like that, surrounded by those types of eyeballs? You know, it's interesting because it was hard, but I also, I mean, have to bring it full circle and realize and hope that, and sometimes I believe this, sometimes I don't, but I'm going to say in this moment, I think that the universe needed to deliver me a humbling experience because I was the worst human when I was Mormon, I was completely superior. I thought I was so smart. I thought I always was right. I was very prideful and I needed a little dose of being humbled. And it was very humbling to have to like, as you think about in holiday, Utah, there's probably, I, there probably weren't very many single moms. The only reason I was at that school or Elsha was at that school is because my parents were rich and my mom was generous enough to let me live in her um, in her house. Yeah. In her mansion. Exactly. And I had certainly like, I was so lucky and incredibly, incredibly lucky to be able to live there. And so I, I definitely don't consider myself a victim of any kind of, you know, bad circumstances, but, um, it, I had to let go of what people thought about me because I knew, and I was embarrassed and ashamed. Um, But I also knew that I could not go back and live the lie that, so I would rather be the mom that people feel sorry for dropping my kid off in my green apron to go wait tables, (laughs) (laughs) which I'm sure was a great look. (laughs) Um, But I, it, it was hard. Did you hard. sense that from uh, yes. from us? Yeah. Did you sense that we were just like, oh, we'll look out for her? Totally. And you know what? I was simultaneously grateful and jealous and ashamed. Yep. Mm. All of those things. Because uh-huh. looking totally back, of course I would have loved to be at the pumpkin patch. Like, that was my kindergartner. And like, I was single for nine years and I missed all of it. Like, I missed it. And... So that was hard, but I was also very grateful to the moms that would include me on the text chain and send, or the email and send the pictures, because then at least I got that. Um, I didn't ever question whether or not I should have left the church and gotten divorced. I, I knew I had very spiritual experiences myself of knowing that that was the path that I was meant to go on, but I, I think I probably did have a lot of anger about, well, gosh, I never would have been in this freaking position in the first place of being this mar- like married so young, having a baby at, at 23, a very young and immature 23, and then having to learn all of these life skills, like how to have a job and how to pay bills and how to get my education and also be a mom at the same time. Because Mormonism doesn't prepare you for that. They just prepare no. for the train. That's it. No, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and it's much harder to get off the train once you're on it. So you just when you, when it does derail, it's like, yeah, you're in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. with no skills. How do you get this? How do you get this back on the track? Yeah, you know? yeah. When yeah, when you're in when you're when your train crashes. Yeah. You're in the middle of nowhere with no skills. Yeah. Right. And it, still incredibly privileged. You know, think of totally. Think of like she was had the means to get a degree and to be supported. But if you were, if you were, you know, had no, if you had to cover a mortgage with a baby and a waitressing and tuition, you would have, you would not have gone to school. No, I wouldn't have lived in the neighborhood I lived in. I would not have had anything that I had. And with all the advantages, it was still super hard, right? Totally. Yeah. 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 And what I would have done is probably what so many single moms do, which is you get an apartment you make it work. You don't get your education. 
I'm and you get so lucky that I got mine. Yeah, like and you, you get remarried. You get remarried. Yeah. I feel like you. Marriage, right? I feel like you have that path. Like, I can work at you know, local lizard. Yeah, and <laughs> shout out scrape at, <laughs> scrape away, or I can just find the another train and get back on it. Find mm-hmm. another priesthood holder and try yeah. again. Yeah, but that I mean, and you know what? That was my end goal. <laughs> like, funny enough, I. It never occurred to me that I could just do it myself. Like I did think, okay, well, I'm going to get my education because I knew I was going to have to support her and myself for a time. But I also completely planned on getting remarried. To an ex-Mormon? Or um, never, I had ho- Mormon, yeah, I hoped. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I knew that like I could never go through the temple again and... Uh, yeah, I knew that it was it was going to be different, or at least I thought it would be. So, yeah. so Heather, just a second ago, you were feeling pretty emotional. Can you tell us what you were feeling? I'm just curious. What? what yeah, you're... I was feeling um, just shame for feeling so superior, and feeling just so pious in that I would look out for Elsha and love Elsha because I don't know what's happened. You know, her mom has to. You know, she's clearly her mom. She has a single mom. And I was feeling sadness because if I had known, I'm just get, keeping it so real. And I know it may, I'm a horrible human being, but this is, I hope that in me sharing this, like maybe it can, I know it won't because you know what I mean, but maybe it can trigger something in someone else that is an active Mormon and maybe behaving this way and not sure why they are. But like, I think that if I had known that you had taken your name off the rolls and that you had openly walked away from the church and defied the church and listened to Mormon stories and had no intention of, if I had known that you were an enemy, I don't think I would have looked out for Elsha. You might have though, Heather. I don't know. I just felt like, I thought, what if I, you know, and like, how superior of me to look out for freaking Elsha. You know what I mean? She's your daughter. She's, you know, Dre is like everything that I want to be in every way. And it always has been. And so much of my strength and growth and even ability to sit here and talk is because of her. So you just have to understand the irony in me being like, oh, look out for Elsha. Oh, I'll take my giant Mark, you know, 5D2 <laughs> $10,000 camera and send you beautifully edited pictures of your daughter at the pumpkin patch. We missed you, you know? <laughs> yeah. Because you can't be there because you're working. Yeah. And I didn't know the circumstances. And if I know the circumstances would have changed it. And the fact is it would have changed it. And just the way it's changing my relationship with my friends and with my kids' moms. Because when I was the Relief Society president getting divorced, I had certain women that absolutely rallied and would pick my kids up and show up and do things without any piety. But I also had people, but now I have people distancing themselves because now it's the choice of, now this is the consequence of my choices. Now Mm -hmm. this isn't circumstance or hard knocks or a missionary opportunity which is I probably saw everything as such, as a missionary opportunity. I will show them how loving, how kind, how cool I am. And I felt all these things, you know, but I, it was from a, 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 an elite place, you know. Mm-hmm. I have truth, knowledge, light, and the perfect life. Therefore, my cup runneth over and I shall pour some into yours. But if I had known that you were self-aware and conscious enough to have you know, taking your name off the rolls of the church, I would have been like, have fun working as a waitress because because wickedness I never was happiness. <laughs> yeah. And until you get your life back on track, you're going to struggle. And I'll be here for you when you do. But you're going to have to learn the hard way. I mean, I, I, I hope I wouldn't have done that. Sure. But I, I anticipate. I what you're saying. I would have. Yeah. And that's horrifying to me. And it makes me uh, feel a deep shame. Well, it's beautiful. To What's new about that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, from, from my standpoint, it's a beautiful story. Like, Dre, I love that you <clears throat> ha- developed enough self-awareness to realize that you were miserable and that you couldn't fake it any longer. 
and that you needed to go through rough stuff to develop kind of some of the character mm -hmm. and the perspective and, and a bigger worldview because that's what happens. Yeah. And, and that's really powerful. But it's also, it's really humbling, Heather, to have you just admit, yeah, I was privileged and yeah, I was elitist and yeah, I was a, you know, because this, this town is full of those people. Yeah. It's full of those people. Uh, you know, I, I, I was divorced. My parents got divorced when they were, I was in middle school and I always like, was it BYU? And there were the rich kids that had the life. And I was like, ah, oh, well, one, will anyone even want me because I'm a divorced kid, kid yeah. from a divorced family. And, and then I'm always like trying to prove myself because like I have to make up for the, the past. Yeah. And it's neat. It's neat to watch this and to realize we're all just human. And the other thing is we talk about privilege and yes, I'm privileged, you're privileged, but pain is pain. It right. doesn't matter. Yeah. It's Rich universal. people kill themselves all the time. Mm -hmm. In fact, probably more often, yeah. you know? And so it's this weird twisted thing where in, there's a couple of people that commented on YouTube, like, oh, all the privilege and no, oh, we're supposed to weep for you. It's not about that per se, but like what we know about wealth is that wealth can cause all sorts of problems and lead to all sorts of dissatisfaction and the simplicity. I mean, you want to have enough money up to like 75 or 80 K, but after that happiness plateaus or goes down, you know, yeah. it, it really yeah. does. Yeah. And so, and pain is pain. And so I don't care where you come from. I just want to get to the human story, vulnerability and rawness, realness, and then growth. And that's what you guys it's so inspirational for me to see you guys modeling this and talking about it. And we'll cover other types of stories, but this is the story we're covering today, and I love it. So, Heather, how did your marriage unravel? Like, what? Tell, talk to us about how, um, how, how it led to that. You know, it's, it's like— You were married how many years? I was technically married 14 years, but okay. we separated after 11. Okay. Well, and then it took three years for us to get married, to get divorced. <laughs> How did it get to how did it get to separation? Like, um, so he's working at vitamin whatever. Yeah, he's working at nutraceutical, and I'm a stay at home mom. And I um, we I basically what happened was kind of a perfect storm of it's it's like as simple of an explanation, but as complicated because it's all in the intricacies of it, right? But basically, I. Um, my third daughter was unplanned and born like 18 months after my second daughter, which is, you know, Norman in Norman Rockwell land in Mormon land. <laughs> it, that's not that big of a deal, yeah. but you know, we, it was a big deal to us because, uh, Billy was not fully happy in his career. And we were, we were starting businesses together. We had a, we started a company called Old Navu, and I was uh, a, a novice photographer, as a lot of stay-at-home moms are. <laughs> but you know, I was I was still an entrepreneur. I was industry and enterprise was kind of like flows through me. So like I couldn't do anything half-assed. I was wanted to be creatively challenged and in ways that would fortify my family. And so I think that's why photography is so attractive to a lot of moms because it's art and technology and it's a progressive skill, but it's also serves your family and saves you money on, you know, on photo shoots. And it's fulfilling because you're with these kids all day. If you can take, and if you can, you know, take pictures of them and, beautify and edit. So I was really into photography and blogs and social media are on the rise by this point. Yeah. Right? They were, they were starting. I remember deuce with Heather Armstrong. Yeah, yeah, Has yeah. she ever been on here? I've tried. She's pretty, she was pretty remarkable to me, but in, in such a different way than she is remarkable, to, remarkable to me. Now I would walk, I would read her blog like with one eye on the door, like my dad was going to walk in, but I could not believe someone was blowing the doors off of Mormonism. Yeah. And I thought she was for sure going to hell. <laughs> and I thought she was funny and provocative and interesting, but I didn't even allow myself to feel those things because I just had disdain. And I kind of probably told myself I was reading it so that I could contain it and, you know, refute it. But the truth is I was reading it because she was a kindred spirit and something resonated with everything with me, everything she was saying. But that would require too much self-awareness and humility for me to really meet her there. So I had to do it from a 
place of, you know, just looking down, but I was a photographer and I, um, wanted a way, we wanted a way to like bring te- every, there was that decree that everyone should have a picture of the temple in their home. I don't remember which prophet said it, but we started taking pictures of the temples and uh, I would edit them in Photoshop and make them like sepia toned and rustic and with the, you know, the papyrus script, you know, like Logan, Utah and beautiful artistic pictures of the temple. And we started a company and Billy took it and ran with it. And so I then became his assistant. I would fly around and take pictures if it, if I could, and he would fly. And we had kind of a bustling enterprise. I mean, it wasn't what paid our bills, but it was just a way for us. It was a side hustle. Yeah, it was a side hustle. He was hustle. still with the... Old Nauvoo. He yeah, was still, he was still the at the company. Okay. Yeah, for sure. I mean, this was a side hustle that um, we, were, we did, and it was really fun. And uh, I started to kind of feel myself a little bit with photography. I started doing fashion photography and photography for fashion bloggers, and he... Uh, started to lose interest in Old Nauvoo and the temple pictures. And he kind of got into some disputes with our distributor and our frame guy and things that just made me sick to my stomach because I felt like, if, oh my gosh, you know, if you let, me just, let me just it. freaking negotiate yeah. this. Yeah. And and they ended up not liking, not wanting to work with us. And so they hired a graphic designer just to do exactly what we were doing. And they started their own company and we weren't suffering or hurting. So, okay, so that business, you know, frittered out and, I felt sad about that because that was kind of contrary to my values, core values. And then we started buying rental homes and I would like kind of manage the rental homes. But I had now having my third baby that kind of tipped the scales from. So the perfect storm would be I started to feel myself in terms of entrepreneurialism and talent and like home enterprise (laughs) photography, managing these rental homes, really you know, running a well-oiled machine of like beautiful Christmas cards, matching outfits, beautiful Easter's, Christmases. Like I was running, I was the CEO of my house, you know, and I was feeling myself and I was- What do you mean feeling yourself? What do you mean? Feeling your power? Um, Ability or- Just the accolades of it, really. Okay. Gaining some confidence. Gaining some confidence and also in my groove, you know, like I found a way to feel- fulfilled, Mm -hmm. to feel challenged, to feel successful and to be involved in the community. And I started to, uh, I started to numb out to his, um, irritation with it. Like, I'd be like, can you come home at five 30? Cause I have this photo shoot at six and he'd say, how much are you going to make? And I'd say $400, you know, but it's like two hours and he'd be like, it's not worth it. Mm. And it was never, it was not worth it because we had plenty of money. $400 $400 was a drop in the bucket and it was requiring us to, to him to inconvenience. It was an inconvenience. It was requiring him to have a time he had to be home. And it was, I was going to be stressed out because I was going to have to have the kids bathed and dinner ready. And, you know, and so it was creating a level of anxiety and antagonism that he did not want and that he was not comfortable with. Mm-hmm. And so I was always trying to just like find these, you know, trying to balance it so that he was not bothered. And then I got pregnant with our third baby and he he was just like, this is overwhelming. So it was either going to be like I had to kind of quit everything and I don't know how to explain it, but just kind of like pull the curtain up like and not have any intimacy or any involvement in my life with him and just run the show and just like make sure his life was as seamless as possible or, um, you know, kind of give up everything I wasn't doing. But his family stepped in and said, oh, this is, Billy's kind of overwhelmed with the thought of a third baby. So we'd have three babies under um, four, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wow. four, two, and a, four, two, and a that's newborn. That's intense. That is mm-hmm. intense. So they hired us a nanny. They gave us money to hire a full-time nanny. And that was um, so generous and really, really awesome. But it also really created a huge divide in terms of our intimacy and our marriage and our ability to work as a team. Because now you have a freaking nanny. I'm not coming home at 530 and don't ask me to because you have a nanny Mm -hmm. and she works 40 hours a week. You have money and like you have help and you have support. And instead of it, instead of us like really digging in together his family um, kind of stepped in to make sure that his, he was not, disturbed by the burden of three small babies and a wife that was 
um, you know, not keeping a house of order, I guess, because I was trying to do photography and do Instagram. And I started a social media company on the side and I just kind of started doing things and I started not caring. And I had a great group of friends and they were smart, successful, beautiful, funny women. And I went to Bunko with them and I did book club. And I was, I felt, I was feeling myself. I had status in the community, you know, and I had, I was getting attention and then I got called to be Relief Society president in our ward. And this was- Aren't a, you pretty young for that? Yeah, very mm -hmm. young. With three kids, three super young kids? Yeah. In a pretty prominent ward? Very prominent ward. Stake presidents, area authorities, mission presidents. I was young. The median age of our ward was like 60. And I was renegade and I was funny and wild. And I had a wonderful bishop that was just- old enough to be old school. You know what I mean? Like the old school Mormon guys that are just like, eh, have a beer once in a while, won't hurt. You know, I mean, like that type of, where he was, he never even considered me. Then he heard I was a return missionary and he was just like, yeah, you should be our next Relief Society president and um, called me to it. And I was, I was ready for it. It just felt normal to me. I didn't realize that that would be kind of like upsetting to Billy. And it was. There was definite conflict and he was not feeling it. And I was feeling myself. And I started getting sick of his Eeyore-type attitude. Like, we're on the freaking train. Stop putting your foot down on the, you know what I mean? Like, he was just trying to always stop it and stagger and embarrass me. And he, we went on a couple trips, and he would undermine me and embarrass me. And I would react and overcompensate. And I would get so frustrated, and I would cry to my sister-in-law. And I said because I saw all of my siblings with these other marriages that were much less compatible than me and Billy's, had much more normal burdens, financial, emotional, child burdens. And I, but they at least towed the line and kind of subscribed to the same story, which is, we love each other. This is eternity. We're married, you know, and like, oh, is that Join a sock in your pocket? Yeah. You know, just like some yeah. like funny, like a smidge of pee on your shirt, but that's <laughs> life. And he refused to. So if we were to, and, and it's, I love the, the candor and the honesty. And um, because that's how you were seeing it. And that's how you maybe still see it in some ways. If you had to kind of put your empathy cap on mm -hmm. and just say, this is a guy who also has feelings, who also wants to do the right thing. Who also wants to be a stand up. Guy and Which husband. is all true. What What do you think he was? What do you think was going on for him? And you don't have to go. Let just spend I a minute. It, he said like from it his to perspective, yeah. what from what his was going perspective? On? How is life not turning out the way he wanted? So, if I were to put on my empathy cap and look back, I was refusing to submit. I had too much of my own agenda on the line. I was prideful. I was happy. I was feeling myself. I wanted him to get on board with me and like support me and herald me and think I was amazing. And, and he didn't. And it was like, I stopped making everything about him and I started making it everything about me and the kids and he sensed it and he felt it. And I gaslit him and pretended like it wasn't happening and that he just was needed to find his own thing, you know, but the truth is I just stopped our whole marriage and our whole courting, I submitted to become whatever he needed me to be. And then at some point in the marriage, I stopped doing that. And there was one distinct moment when our oldest daughter was getting baptized and she was eight years old. And he had made a decision that he wanted the baptism to be at a different time. And this was just an innocuous thing that just became like the straw that broke the camel's back. And I had always accommodated or you know, pretended to accommodate it, but like talked him through it so that I got what I wanted, you know, just kind of that old dance of manipulation and just incompatibility. And I said, I'm not going to change the time of the baptism. I've arranged the font because I didn't do it with the stake, but I did a special private fancy baptism because I was superior, you know, I, I didn't want to cattle call baptism with all the kids in the stake. So I had to arrange the font, the speakers, the pianist, the chairs, you know, 
The you had pr- printed the invites. I printed already. the invites. They had beautiful photography. They were engraved. You know, I'd sent them out. And he said he wanted to accommodate um, a family member that was flying in coincidentally on the same day. And he wanted her to be at the baptism. It was about family. She needed to be there. And I was like, she's not even an active member of the church. It means nothing to her. She baptized her children Catholic when they were born. Like, no, I'm not changing it. And I cried to my parents and like my dad said, and he said, fine. He texted me and said, fine, I'll, I'll move. You can have the baptism when you want to have it. I'll move out next week. Whoa. Yeah. He just dropped the gauntlet. Mm -hmm. And I, was reeling, told my parents, and they said, okay, let's just, let's print up some flyers. We'll send flyers to everyone we've invited to the baptism saying that we're going to do it an hour later because then then that'll fix everything. And I said no. And I don't remember why I said no. Fear and like I had was presenting this perfect veneer to the world and I wasn't going to send out flyers, you know. I we This is a fancy baptism. <laughs> and it was really and I was the Relief Society president. It was just a lot. So um, I didn't do it. And it seemed like a small thing, but it was just really a battle of wills. And I dug in. And then I had too much pride and I was too pissed to work it out. So I just kept saying, hey, you said you're moving out. Move out. Move out. Mm. Because you've been saying you're going to do stuff our whole marriage and you don't do it. So like, let's see if you really move out. And I really didn't think he would move out. I thought maybe he'd move out work through it, come back. And I would just be the dutiful, you know, hero welcoming the prodigal son. And that didn't happen. And it took us three years to um, get divorced and we've been divorced five years. Really quickly, just cause I, I want to just uh, try and understand a tiny bit more or at least explore it and then we can move on. But in a, in a way you weren't totally on the stereotypical train. And what I mean by that is you were doing too much. Like having entrepreneurial ambitions as you no, your job is to raise the kids and to be a good support to your husband. Yeah. You serve in your calling, but then he's serving in his calling, like doing business and entrepreneurial stuff. I mean, there's a lot of warnings in Mormonism that women shouldn't work outside the home, that a woman's job is to raise the kids and support the husband. And so from a, from a being on the train Orthodox Mormon perspective, and I think it's awful Right. No. Yeah. But you were you were a little bit too ambitious in a sure. in an Orthodox Mormon context. Yeah. How much of that is how much of my, is that? Is it's possible? absolutely true, and that's why, you know, my ambition and my I don't even call it ambition. I just called it my self centeredness and my self absorption and my own awareness of my talents and needs superseded my commitment to my marriage, ultimately because. I should have just put my head down and done whatever it took to keep him happy. I think that I realized that I couldn't keep him happy and that it had nothing to do with me. Although you never really believe that, you know, it's always something to do with us. It's always a little bit about you. Yeah, (laughs) for sure. But then definitely I felt like I, I just have to be honest. Like when he said, I'll leave, I was like, well, he'll never leave first denial. And then I thought, so what if he does? I didn't feel heartbreak when he left. I felt devastation over the loss of my entire purpose for life and my family and my eternal salvation and that it would never be what I set out for it to be, which was not a blended family, which was not a second chance around happy ending. I wanted it un deterred. I wanted my children BICs. I wanted the, you know, I wanted the whole thing. It was not, there was nothing about a consolation prize that was going to work for me. And yet you kind of requested it. I mean, yeah, I did. And I think, but I, I feel like I requested it because I was once again, emasculating him, challenging him and trying to force him into a dominant leadership patriarchal role that I was also unwilling. I mean, you know what I mean? I was setting mm-hmm. him up, setting the guy up and I'm a tough opponent. And he knew that on some level. And I also have to be totally candid that I love men 
And I was and am still working through a lot of misogyny and a lot of, I just esteem men to be more valiant and smarter and more capable and more righteous. And I thought that, you know, he was probably right to reject a lot of these things about me. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, um, I just, I was like grateful to him on some level for leaving because it was, I never would have. But, but as I hear the story, you kind of wanted it to end because you were kind of bigger than the role you were in. I get a sense that you, you big, and when I say big, I mean no, I, I, yeah. soul, spirit, right? It seems like you were, you are, and I think both of you are bigger sold than the Mormon train, you know, had room for. And, and so there's this weird thing where you were trying to force him to be the patriarch that you did not want to submit to. Yeah, and it's, he, <laughs> that's what's totally messed up. That's why I take... He couldn't win. He couldn't win. He couldn't win. win. And he was wise enough and smart enough. And that, that's how I tell that story. You know, he's wiser and smart enough and more authentic enough to say, this is not going to work. And I don't want to spend another day married to you. And I am going to leave the marriage. Yeah. And I said, oh, really prove it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're not fit. You're not the mold. Neither of you were the mold for what you were put into. Mormon marriage doesn't prepare you to be emotionally connected. It prepares you to get on the train and to stay disconnected because there's, you're too busy to be connected. And once you're connected, it's all about what your wants and needs are. And there's no room for your wants and needs. So you're individually not well suited. And then you're not enjoying your time together. And then you want to, you want to kind of, branch out and do things outside and then he can't fit the mold. It's just, you're all victims, mm -hmm. really. He's not a bad guy. He's not a, I mean, we all have quirks and personality traits and problems, but in the end, we were all, we we're all kind of victims to a bunch of stuff that we really didn't totally choose that we inherited that started six generations ago when Joseph Smith said that he talked to God and that he created this book from an angel with golden plates. And we're all just kind of like downwinders, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and, and dealing with the consequences. But, but the thing I just want to say is that you talked about, you talked about these two choices where you almost talked about it like it's misery either way, either you stay in the marriage and self-medicate and, and have this double life and you're miserable or you get divorced and you blow up this dream that you were living for and that was everything you wanted and that either way it's it's terrible but i don't buy that yeah i i agree and i you i both did I, each other a huge favor and uh, yeah, you didn't and wait another 10 or 20 years i hear everything you're saying but what i really wanted was just a semi good cohesive marriage it didn't have to be rainbows and unicorns. It just had to be not self-medication and deceit and affairs and denial. And it didn't have to be self-discovery and building a business and finding myself. I really just wanted just a medium life with a man that just professed to love me. He, I mean, I knew he didn't, but like, just profess it. You didn't think he loved you? No. We didn't love each other. Ever? I mean, I don't really know. Yeah. No, I. we don't know in Mormonism, we don't know what emotional intimacy is. We don't even, we're illiterate about it. Yeah. So how do we ever develop it? You just get on the train and you go forward. So of, of course, what, what you marry with is with hormones and with hope and optimism and passion. And a plan. But that's not love. And a plan. But and that's not love. That's of, not love. It's not love, but it's a plan. Yeah. It's a plan. It's, a plan's better than no plan, but it's not love. Yeah, but I made the decision to have an eternal marriage when I was eight years old and got baptized yeah. when I taught it on my mission. Like, yeah. how I felt about it was irrelevant. Yeah. How he treated me was irrelevant. Yeah. How we managed it was irrelevant. Yeah. And I would trade everything to go back to the Garden of Eden yeah. where my eyes have not been opened and I do yeah. not see. Yeah. I'm not happier now 
than I imagine I would have been had it worked out for me. And that is the truth. I'm making the best of it, and I'm deeply grateful to Dre because otherwise I was just on the treadmill waiting to, I was never gonna remarry. I was never going to be honest about how I felt about the church with my children. And I was just gonna toe the line and try to keep my kids from getting totally screwed up by the fact that I was not able to sell it, you know, or keep it all together. And Dre, were you watching their marriage fall apart? Were you friends by that point? No, Mm -mm. I had no idea. In fact, I remember finding out that they had been divorced for like a while, or like probably separated. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you were took actually us a divorced. Long time yeah, to get divorced. But yeah. I think it was some. It was, I think we were at Corner Canyon High School at the debate tournament, and you said something about, oh, so and so and so recommended that therapist. You know, like since we got divorced, like that we should probably put the kids in therapy or something like that. And I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't even because she was like the last person. She was like the queen of the moms. <laughs> She was really, and Relief Society she, president. Yeah. yeah. And like, and I, and we. Queen of the moms. She, I really were. was. <laughs> you were. I remember like seeing you and queen just being like. Queen of the holiday like, moms? Is that it? She's the queen of somebody, the moms. Somebody described me and they're like, um, somebody asked me about you. And I said, well, she's the most popular of everyone in PTA. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wow. And she was. <laughs> she totally was. But yeah, no, I wasn't. Heather is really, really, really good as, as authentic and open as she is, she's really good at like selling what, what she wants you to see I, on brand. Like I'm like, on brand for Mormonism. You yeah, know, like, and totally. And so I, I'm sure I was like, surprised you even like revealed to me that you would consider therapy for your kids, you know, cause we weren't even friends. It's probably cause I knew that Elsha Elsh had told you, like Ashley probably said Elsha told her mom. Or something. Yeah. And so I or maybe knew that you assumed knew. that she had. No, I don't think I don't think I even knew that you guys had been divorced or because were that's separated. what they kind of bonded over though, Ashley and Elsha. Yeah. Yeah. Your kids. Yeah, uh-huh. because they were afraid to talk about it to anyone. And then mm. Georgia said it to some friend and that friend's mom called me and said, Are you and Billy separated? Just kind of asked me and I said, why? No. Why? I think I lied and said no. I mean, people didn't know he had moved out for like a year. Okay, how does that work in in sort of Royal Mormonism or like suburban, more upper class Mormonism. How do you hide separation and divorce? Husbands from, are from, turns from out pretty easy. Turns out pretty easy. <laughs> Husbands are very easily dismissed from our worlds. How? Well, and if you're already if you already have your own life at that point, you kind of did, Heather. You were doing social media. You were doing photography. You had your group of friends. You had the bunko night. You had relief you society. Had your, you had relief society. Where's Billy for all of that anyway? I don't think that a ton changed. Yeah, and I think that's why none of us noticed. And everyone's just like, he's working. He's mm-hmm. husband's work. Yeah, I mean, he's they esteem men with man. money. You esteem them to be busy all the time. Traveling. If they're if they're dismissive, it's because they are probably thinking about some million dollar deal. Not just that they're jerks, you know. Yeah, we just kind of, you know, cushion, cushion the bad behavior or the absence of them. And because what do you have to complain about? You've got a roof over your head, food to eat. You know, Beamer. pottery barn clothing, you know, and like mm-hmm. little wooden toys. You know what I mean? You've got it all. Like nobody's worried mm. about it. And you're not in a place to complain because I didn't want to expose my kids because I knew that it would change the way they were received and the way I was received. It's not that noble. And and the way that I it was like my lifeline. This marriage was everything, not because it was the love of my life, not because it was you know, so fulfilling. It's because this is what we do. What is Mormonism based on? The new and everlasting covenant of marriage. Yeah. Marriage. We weren't in love with other people. We just couldn't make it work. And that ruined my life. Well, changed your life. Ruined it. It ruined, it, it crashed the train. All of this is a consolation prize that I would trade. I would trade it right now. So I still say ruined. This, I mean, you say resilience, but I'm just, you know, I'm just surviving. 
Yeah, and I see a phoenix rising, but she doesn't, and that's okay. Maybe you'll get there, but maybe you won't, and you'll make the best of it, Heather. A lot of times, I think, especially in the church, we have so much pressure on ourselves over things that we have zero control over. Being a mother, we can't choose if we get pregnant or not. It's mother nature. You know, a marriage working out, it's two people. We are not in charge of that. Like, those are the two biggest pressures on women, and we have zero control, and that's, that's it's just really hard. And who our children become. It's somehow some this reflection on our parenting and our you know, diligence to the gospel. And like, I have, I mean, these humans that were born in our family, like whomever they become is their path, you know? Yeah, for sure. It's nothing to do with me. And that is so much pressure, you know? And I used to put that on my kids. You can't wear that. Especially now that I'm a single mom. And I'm like, wear what you, be whomever you want to be, love whomever you want to love, Dress how, you know what I mean? Just tap into whoever you are and figure it out because I will love you. Mm -hmm. I will get down on my knees and love you, you know? And that's the phoenix rising, really, is Mm -hmm. the chance for my kids to have dreams and to achieve those dreams. It's like that thing we just read yesterday where it's like I put all of Mm -hmm. my, now I just have no dreams for myself. I just put them all on hopefully changing the path for my daughters because I love them and they, I don't, I want them to be free of the shame and guilt and um, sadness. I feel just because of, I couldn't do the Mormon thing the way I wanted to. It's as simple as that, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, how, you've been divorced how long? Five years. Five years. Okay. But I've been separated nine. I've been doing it alone for nine years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's hard stuff. And you guys are being so raw and authentic. And um, it is inspiring. Um, and it will be to many, many people. Because you guys aren't alone. Mormonism has the same divorce rate as everyone else. You know? And, and this is happening everywhere. And and the more, the more that the church people realize that the church isn't what we all thought, and they all got on this train, and the church, the place they're going isn't making them happy, and it's actually not even it's Oz, it's the it's the man behind the curtain, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like marriages are ending left and right, and so we're all kind of pioneers in a sense. We're we're kind of <laughs> you, you guys like that. We're well, kind like of. <laughs> ancestors yeah. <laughs> blazing a new yeah. trail no, at least my own trail well, yeah. we are we are like th- having a structure is valuable there's value there's value in having a structure and we had the structure it just turns out the structure wasn't built on on what we thought it wasn't the truth that we thought mm-hmm. and so now that now we're having to strike out and find the new way but and it's even- painful yeah, but, but even when you say that, it is painful and it's and it is real. But even as you say that, I in my mind and in my heart hear it and I know it and I process it, but I also think, but if it works out, it is perfect. The plan of happiness when it when it's not fractured, it's it seems it's still in my mind as ideal. Yeah. And so I'm just sad that I didn't, that I didn't choose the right, I don't know what I'm sad about. You know, I'm just sad that we didn't choose the right people and that we thought we could make it work with just tenacity and grit and we couldn't. And I, I understand that this is like a new dawn and a new, you know, opportunity and effort, but I just believe that I somehow still hold this belief that the people that are married in the temple at both believing the gospel are happier and better families than mine and other broken families and other godless families. And that's, that's how deep the chip is implanted. And that is something we talk about all the time Mm -hmm. because it's even outside of the context of religion, the concept of the nuclear family, the Norman Rockwell family is how we define success in so many ways. And that's not unique to Mormonism or unique to us. It's just, it's 
the plight of women. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Yeah, that's true. Mm. So how did you guys become closer friends? And then, Desperation, John. There's, there's <laughs> darkness finds leads into darkness. Yeah. There's two. There's two. There's definitely at least two things I want to cover. One is your business, and the other is your faith journey, Heather, as it's evolved. So, just make sure as you as we continue that you weave both of those in. Well, my faith journey is the story of the business, yeah. and our friendship is the story of the business, and really the phoenix rising from the ashes of both of our lives is the story of the business. All right, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Should we do it? Yeah, let's yeah. do it. I think Dre should tell it and I will, I will. All right. I would like to turn the time over now to <laughs> sister Nord. Nord. So Heather, um, she will speak until 10 to the hour, at which point <laughs> Heather and I, we, we were kind of just casual acquaintance friends. And like we had shared that moment at the debate thing and and I, I, I liked Heather, but she, and she was the queen of the moms. I knew she was way above like my level. Um, but our girls got really close in junior high. And so we did see a little bit more of each other, just driving the girls back and forth. And I remember, um, I remember dropping Elsha off to play with Ashley and you were there with, with one of like her gay best friends. And I remember being like, Oh, this girl has a gay best friend. I did not expect this from Madame <laughs> Relief Society president, you know? And so I kind of like started getting an inkling that like Heather was, I knew she was cool, but I was like, okay, like this girl has got a little bit of edge. That's, you know, I like it. <laughs> and um, we ran into each other one night at the uh, choir, at the choir yeah. concert. Yeah. And I had s since been remarried. And so I was like kind of integrating more probably into the, the normal mom group. I was staying at home. I wasn't working anymore. I was, you know, having babies kind of falling back in line. And, um, Heather said to me, Hey, I've been doing social media for this plastic surgeon. Um, he's shutting down his practice. He's filing bankruptcy. I, th I think I'm going to buy it. And like, how long ago was this? This was 2016. Yeah. Four years ago. Yeah. And she was like, I, and I had worked front desk at a med spa for years. And so she, and I wasn't anymore, but she said, I know you've been in the industry. Would you want to come in sometime and just like chat with me and kind of like, I don't know, show me the ropes. Like, I just, you know, don't totally know what I'm doing in this space. And that was kind of the beginning of it. Like we started, but I assumed she'd say no. Cause she had a one-year-old and a three-year-old. Yeah. So I was kind of throwing you a bone. You were. And the truth is personally, I was in a really, really tough place in my life because I was here. I had kind of done round two of the dream, but I did it the right way with, you know, this guy that was super successful and he was okay with me being out of the church and wasn't going to push us, you know, as long as he could maybe take the kids to church every once in a while. Like so you remarried a Mormon guy. Yeah. But he was inactive. Okay. Um, less, active. less active. Yeah. And and so I, and, but like my family loved him and we had this beautiful life and we had two gorgeous little boys and he was an amazing stepdad to Elsha and I was still unhappy and deeply, deeply unhappy. And I had been, Do you know why? Oh yeah. I, yeah, I know why is because I was like in the box, you know, I was, you went back in the box. Yeah. In the, in the woman box, I didn't have to go to church, but I still fell completely back in line with all of the patriarchal beliefs completely. And mm. I didn't even know it. And so I, all of my value was completely based on being the perfect wife, being the perfect mom. And I wasn't fulfilled doing that. And none of my emotional needs were being met whatsoever. And my ther I had talked with my therapist and he had said, well, have you considered maybe going back to work, that might help. And I was just like, are you freaking kidding me? No way. Here I like found this guy that wants me to be a stay-at-home mom. Like that's all I wanted to do. I was tired. I've waited tables for eight years. And like now here I am and I'm really, I'm going to go back to work. Okay. But I had like kicked it around. He thought it was a, a good idea to maybe get me out of the house. Maybe I was having like some postpartum and maybe that's, you know, just, I needed just a little bit of a change of scenery, some connection with adults, that kind of thing. And you had two sons with him. 
Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And they so were little. Had, yeah. Toddlers. Yeah. Roman was like 18 months, I think, when by the time like I fully was with Beauty Lab. But um, anyway, it's, so it was kind of this gift from the heavens that Heather just threw this out to me. And I was like, yes, yes, please. I absolutely, let's trade for Botox. I will come in. <laughs> I'll do whatever you want. I will work front desk. I will whatever. Let me just jump in for a second. So, sorry. So like you think about how, how hard it was to get divorced and how waiting tables for eight years. Uh -huh. There's a, you know, you think, I would think that maybe, and maybe you did, you have this mindset of like, well, this second marriage is going to work. I'm going to marry my soulmate and 100%. we're going to have a great marriage and there's no way that we're ever going to get divorced. And all the things that were wrong about the first marriage, I'm not going to repeat. So all the patriarchy stuff and whatever, I'm not going to fall back into that. What my guess is you went into it thinking that you were going to avoid all the mistakes that had led to the problems oh, yeah. in, the, in the first marriage. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. I've never been so sure of anything in my life as you were sure as I knew that I was supposed to marry him. And, and it's funny that I even say that like that's supposed to, it's, it's so hard to kick it. This idea that there's this meant to be person for us. Um, that God is willing for us to find yeah. and marry and form a life with regardless like, of the circumstances. I, he was, and he, he's a wonderful, wonderful human being who I, I love and appreciate. We're not married anymore. Um, but I could not have picked a better dad for my kids, a better stepdad for my daughter, a, a more dedicated provider, a really a stand up guy. And so all of those things, I mean, it was box, 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 checked them all way more than with my first husband. I was just in love with that guy. And th this one, I was like a hundred percent sure. And so it was really tough and confusing for me w when I, a few years in, a few years in was like, Oh boy, this, I am really unhappy. This is not good. And it must be some, there's something clearly, and I do believe this. I think there's something deeply flawed about me as a human because I just can't seem to make it work. Even with really wonderful, solid, dedicated people. You really think it's you? I do. I do. Hmm. I, I think that. You agree, I, Heather? Yeah. Yeah. It's me. Because she is bigger than the box of wife. Mm. Well, thank you for saying that. She's much bigger than the box of wife. And like, that's a burden. Yeah. But I also have like, we're all so flawed and we all have so many, so I have so much personal work to do still. I guess what I'm 40 and I have no business getting married, not at 21, but I have, and not at 30. I have so much work to do because there is a lot of deprogramming. I'm still doing 17 years out of the church. And I still, the, the chip is embedded deep. It really is. And even after, cause I even hearing Heather say what she said a few minutes ago, I was thinking, gosh, like if she could let go of the religion, I think it would shift things because I would feel the same way. I think, and the reason that I don't is because I, I have let go of a lot of things with the religion, but there are still like my, my value as a mom and the way that I show up as a woman is completely like I, I base the standard on the standard of the church, Yeah, you know, and, and truly. So when my therapist like had thrown out, well, maybe you should go back to work. I was just like, I roll. Okay. Well, maybe I guess let's just, just try add that to like this because you knew it wouldn't change your, your duties at home. <clears throat> no, you know what I mean, like it wasn't like, Oh, I'm working. So I'm not going to be able to do all You're going to have to do all of that and then work. Yeah. And it wasn't even that like, I, I didn't mind the duties at home. I just was so unfulfilled. I was like, I felt like the cheetah in the cage in Glennon's book of like, okay, there's, I want to go run. I want to be free. I want to explore. I want to sleep under the stars. I want to hunt something and kill it and eat it. Like that's what I wanted <laughs> to do. Cheetah. You're a cheetah. You but like, chance. yeah, exactly. I know. I, I rock the cheetah often just because Channel. it's a great reminder. And, you know, but that feeling of, oh, I should, I should be grateful. This is the life I wanted. I manifested this exact life. And so I'm going to be good. I'm going to be okay. And then when Heather offered me to come just 
work with her just very casually and like non-committally. I was like, this is perfect because like I can sell it to my husband as like, it's just like a fun side project. We And he and I had talked about, I was struggling with the depression and everything. And and I had said, well, maybe if I got some help with the kids and I could just have like a couple hours to myself every week, like maybe that would help me feel better and whatever, which is so entitled and makes me feel ridiculous for even saying that because, you know, I was so lucky to have a nanny for a few hours a week. And but I, I could sell it like that, like, oh, I'm gonna just go work with Heather. You remember Heather, it's Ashley's mom and she's doing this little business. And and like, as we started kind of working together, it was like really fun. And I really connected with Heather and I was like, holy crap, like I kind of love this. And like, it it was, she was like running this business and like didn't really know about the business. I had no clue and, what I was doing. But Nothing. like was doing no it and was, and everybody was listening to her. And, and I was like, okay, like I knew that I should stick with Heather. <laughs> <laughs> and then the one day, do you want to tell about when I... Let, let me jump in and ask one question. Okay. So Heather, so you would have had a divorce and if you're getting divorced from a man who comes from money, I'm sure it's a complicated divorce. Lawyers are involved. I mean, it ended and, up, yeah. And, and I'm sure that finances are um, a significant part of that whole equation. And so whatever you would have ended up with, I'm just curious, kind of like what went into this idea of, I want to start a business. I want to buy a business. I want to become an entrepreneur. I want, I want to just get to the beginnings of your drive to do what becomes Beauty Lab. Is it because you needed to uh, monetarily? Was it because you needed to psychologically? Was it because you, this is just, you've always wanted to start something? What, what was going on in your mind? You could have just like, I'm sure, just lived on alimony and child support and raised your kids. Absolutely, right? yeah. So what was behind it? What were you thinking? Um, and what was driving you? I was absolutely dead inside. Meaning what? What, what? After the divorce? No joy. No, no joy, no hope, no palatable future, no guidance in how to navigate the divorce. No, I couldn't even say I was divorced. I couldn't say ex-husband. I couldn't say the girl's father. I still... Pre oh, you couldn't say that because I couldn't say that because I couldn't admit it to myself. Shame. Too much shame, yeah, and painful and um, financially. You know, we were well taken care of, but I had when we when he first separated, he kind of put me on a st strict budget, and I I was not used to that. It was very it was very hard for me, but so I had that's when I had started kind of like getting creative and like doing Instagram and photography for free Botox and just finding ways to trade my skill set for perks that weren't, wouldn't come out of the budget. But then the divorce was settled and finances were fine and there was no financial need for me to work. And that was, that, that was why, you know, it wasn't that there, he was just so generous. He's just like, I want a full-time mom. And my attorney was like, well, then you have to pay her to be a full-time mom. And so the, I was a very generous divorce and I was totally taken care of, but I was just dead inside. I had no guidance, no hope of a different future. I had no need, no financial need to start a second career, no financial need to work outside the home. And so I was living on the dole and a part of me was like, he is going to pay. I'm not going to get remarried. I'm not going to get him out of this. Like you're going to, you know, the easiest part of this whole mess is for you to write a check and you're going to write a check because that's all, that's the only thing that even bridges the gap of my world being destroyed and his as well, but it didn't, I was just, had that scope and my children's and I really made it about the kids. You know, the kids are going to be messed up. The kids are from a broken home. The kids aren't going to get to marry the people that they probably could have married because they're not going to be top three of the beauty pageant winners. You know what I mean? Because of this mm -hmm. blight. And I also couldn't even fathom like my family tree and like how it was gonna work out because I was so proud of that pedigree and I had broken the whole line. So I had no hope, I had no palatable future, I had no joy, I had no happiness, I had no, I was absolutely dead inside. And I was still doubling down as a mom because of my love for my children and because I had been trained as from an early age how to be a mom so I could kind of dial that in. And the doctor asked, 
the doctor said, will you help me with this business? And I saw that the business was horribly run. It was, seemed obvious to me, but it, then I would sit in a meeting. They'd say, can you come to the meeting just like as our Instagram girl to give us some insight? And they would sit there and I'd say, well, this is ass backwards. Like, is no one else hearing what we're talking about? Like, mm. this is the, your business. This is your plan. Yeah. <laughs> you know, get her. Like it just, and I just was just speaking from my heart. And so when I was in it and when I was being asked, I performed and I would say what I would do and what I would do different. And he knew I had financial means. So he asked if I wanted to buy in as a partner. And I was dead inside. So I didn't say, sure, you know, like I said, I'll see. So I'll work with you for three months and see. It became very clear to me that the business was tanking. There was, they were bankrupt or going to soon be bankrupt and no money coming in. And I didn't want to be a partner with them. So I said, I'll, I'll, buy it and pay you as like a contractor and see if I can figure this out. And I couldn't figure it out. I had no medical experience. I knew I had marketing and business, intuitive business sense. Wouldn't you say that's mm -hmm. probably my skill totally. set? Totally, yeah. Instincts, I have great instincts and confidence and no other experience. And I was, I got in, bought it, sunk most of my divorce settlement and money I'd saved into purchasing it and running it because it was eating up money. And I realized that I was screwed. This was the tight, we say it was the Titanic on the bottom of the ocean <laughs> with Bardic, we were a barnacle. We just had, there was, it was absolutely not solvent. And I had, was terrified because now I had, with no desire, put myself in this position and it was not going to succeed. So I was going to try to spin it and create some value and then sell it and just get out by the skin of my teeth. I knew I was gonna lose money on it, but I didn't wanna be destitute and have to be like, I made a bad choice, I bought a med spa, you know, <laughs> and it failed. And so I was trying to get in, figure it out, spin it, sell it, and pretend it never happened. And that's when I reached out to Dre. And so I had, I had no ambition really other than to at first, it was an opportunity that I was just, you know, I was an opportunist. I was like, okay, sure. Okay. I can make a buck. I can let's... make a buck or let's see what I can do. And then it was like, oh, this is way too much. And I don't understand the business and I got to get out. And now I have to save my name and my dignity because I'm in it. And then I had Dre come help me. And within three months, like her level of competence and her level of, um, competence. I just can't explain like absolute competence. It was like having, it's like you've been pedaling a bike uphill and all of a sudden someone's pedaling with you and you're like, I love biking. <laughs> she just was competent and effective and smart and didn't, didn't need any handholding or anything. I mean, she just jumped in and was running with it and she knew the business. And then all of a sudden we realized it, it was a way for me to, um, like you were the industry. So then I could come yes, in with my business yeah. sense and say, let's switch this. And it was like, we needed each other to kind of yin push off of yin and yang. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. What, what value did you add, Dre? What were like two or three of the main things you, you brought? I mean, I think the main thing that I brought was experience in the med spa space. And so I could come in and say, okay, Heather, listen, this is how every med spa is doing it. What do you want to do? And she would say, well, I think that's dumb. And I don't like this thing because she came from a pure consumer point of view. And so it was really the perfect marriage of experience versus, or like the industry versus the consumer. And then it was like, she would say how she wants it to go. And then I knew what, like, cause there are a lot of regulations in, cause it's medical. Okay. Well, we can't exactly do it that way, but I think I hear what you're saying. And so I think if we do this, this, and this, we can create that experience and also still be compliant. And so I think my, my experience is what I brought, but then also like, for some reason, Heather and I just vibed, like I understood how she was and like what she wanted. I knew her vision and I could see it. And I was excited about like making that a reality. And I think that has been like our, our best thing together, yeah. you know? And I, I have to, it would, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, <laughs> I could also be fully Mormon around Dre and also fully not Mormon. And I had never had what a friend like mean? that. What does that mean? 
How like we feel? could go for coffee and then she could, we could sing hymns together. And I didn't she carry their way. Me. And she had dinner and a cocktail in her husband's hand at 5 p.m. Her kids were her number one priority. She fit this in in bits and pieces where they, she was a dedicated stay at home mom with a side gig, as was I. Uh huh. And we could like text each other in the middle of the night and like be like, I can't sleep because of this so-and-so's person, but like, also, I'm sorry, I couldn't be there because I had choir. I had the choir concert and like, oh, I'm sorry, we have to move that meeting at three o'clock because it's my day to run carpool. Do you think if I was working with someone who was in the same boat that that would even ever work? It wouldn't have, but like we completely forgave each other for- And understood and under other. Yeah, like, but, but we could like, the business could never be first, Heather. And, oh. and I forgave you for that. And you forgave me for that because we would like cry and think, do you know how successful we could be if we could just like dedicate actual time to this instead of if like, you had wives basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If we had so wives, she's my wife and like, and you no. know, we would j make that joke. But if you had stay at home wives, <laughs> oh, yeah. we would be, we'd be <laughs> but, so much more successful. But I mean, essentially that's like a nanny and like, we've both had nannies and that still wasn't enough because it's, it's the manager. shame. Like I could give my nanny 40 hours a week, but I give her. 14 because like my husband and my kids want me home and we sense that yeah. and like I can't ask Billy to pick up from school today or he said I won't so mm -hmm. I have to leave this meeting right now with it's a million dollar deal but I have to be at carpool at 3 p.m and, like, and I don't have an option literally our, our podcast we have to end it at a certain time because I have to pick up for school like that's just, that is our absolute reality. We have to cram everything we do between nine and three. It was this perfect partnership that we both just understood exactly where each other were at. And being with Heather also was really good for me, like to work through so, like even more of my issues with the church because like here was this person who I would like connected with on such a deep level. And like, she was the exact kind of Mormon that I was too. And we could like sing hymns together and like talk about the doctrine and the scriptures. And she let me say things like, well, that sounds made up. And, and I would be like, and, and she would <laughs> joke back to me, but th there was like such mutual love and respect between the two of us that like, it was just a safe place. You know what I mean? And it was really important for us to learn that too, because she was Mormon. I was ex Mormon and we were trying to build a business that would appeal to women in Utah, which Humans is in Utah. Yeah. You know, but I mean, specifically, yeah, specifically women yeah. like us, women like, and us. like we really wanted to build a business that, sh that we would both want to go to. And so that means that we would have to make a safe place for women, regardless of, their religious upbringing, regardless of what they believed, we wanted a place where everyone would feel comfortable. And so I think keeping that as our North Star helped us to be successful because it really wasn't about the money. Like I didn't, never I didn't need the money. the money. I needed mental health <laughs> and Heather needed something to focus her energy on. And so it really wasn't about the money. And that is, I mean, not every, hardly any businesses have that luxury, but we did. We did. And, and it, it provided the way for us to build a business that was based on love. And mm -hmm. we were motivated to empower women that were kind of burdened with perfectionism and burdened with shame and burdened with not feeling good about yourself and burdened with all kind of the plight of womanhood, you know, and mm -hmm. we, we didn't want to, we wanted to meet them on their level because we felt it. Yeah. And we loved them. Well, and truth and we be told. We wanted to alleviate it, you know, in yeah. some way. Well, and truth be told, it's, I mean, it can be kind of a tricky industry, especially in Utah. It's, there is a negative side to it. It's, you know, it's a med spa. And so we do things like um, Botox, lip filler, laser hair removal, skin care, medical weight loss, cool sculpting, kind teeth of whitening. teeth whitening, yeah. kind of all of those BS surface level um, appearance type things that like, there, there is a yucky side of that for sure. And Heather and I really leaned into, you know what, if we're going to be in this industry, we both fell into it. Like I, I got into it, not like just a friend. I was desperate. And so I needed a job there. And that's how I got into it. Same with you. You were just doing social media. Mm -hmm. And so we're like, if we're going to be in this industry that can really be a slippery slope to vanity and 
not feeling good about yourself and all those things, let's let's look at the light side of that. Let's look at the positive side. Let's empower women to feel good about themselves. Let's create a safe space. Let's let us women decide what we want to look like instead of having it dictated by a, you know, 70 year old doctor, second counselor in the state presidency that your body's just fine, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. And so we both felt really passionate about the direction that we wanted to take the business. Still, of course, it was like just our fun side gig. Um, and weirdly, like it started growing and we like started, like people started talking about Beauty Lab. It res whatever we were doing was resonating. And I think what we were trying to do is say, this is a necessary evil. Looking good is a necessary evil. And we are going to take this asymmetry of information that favors the medical practices, favors the industry, favors the surgeons, favors these men that come in and point out your insecurities, upsell you, take your money, you know, and send you on your way. We're going to take that and we're going to disrupt it. We're going to say no more. We're going to put the power back in the hands of our friends, of ourselves. And we're going to show all the ways that like this exploitative industry can really be harnessed to empower us, to dictate who we are, how we want to look, how much we're willing to pay, and who gets our money. And that did not exist. We would all say self-improvement is fine for teeth, for glasses, like LASIK, mm -hmm. for hair color. Yeah. Coloring in your eyebrows, sure, sure, we'll allow that. It doesn't seem too invasive. But now the bar is getting lower and lower. So like, what if I have a gummy smile and tiny lips and it keeps me from speaking up in meetings and it keeps me from standing up for, to my husband or letting my kids talk back to me, you know, because society has burdened us with what we want to look like. And for whatever reason, we don't know what planted those seeds of what we want to look like, but women know what they want to look like. And women should be able to define that for themselves and have access to whatever tools they need. And if it's Botox, so they don't see furrows of stress and worry on their brow, or if it is lips because they want to feel young and vibrant and more attractive to themselves or to their spouse or to whomever, if they want their receding chin to be injected and it takes 15 minutes and it can take someone who's crippled with insecurity about that. And we can flip that in a 15 minute appointment for 900 bucks. That's a game changer. And no mom would deny their kid that opportunity. And the world is evolving. And these are safe, affordable tools that are out there. But the medical industry has shamed us, made them ridiculously expensive, told us the terms which with we could access them. And none of that was true. That was all what they presented to us. So when we bought our business and started Beauty Lab, we're like, you don't have to do $10,000 worth of injections. You can do $200. Yeah. You can fix one mole if that one mole is keeping you from being your true self. And I certainly understand the feeling of like my outward appearance not reflecting like who I am because kind of if we were to go back to BYU, like I was like, you wanted to marry me, you know, <laughs> because I was going to, if you wanted someone that was going to stick with it to the end, like marry me, but I didn't look like that type of girl. And I'm not saying injections or beauty lab could have changed that for me, but if it could have, I would want to know about it and choose if I wanted it or not. And so we made Kylie Jenner our muse. And since you're mm -hmm. a fuddy-duddy Mormon, you probably don't even know who Kylie Jenner <laughs> no, is. I, I think I do. But she was 17 and she was in a very, you know, public, high-profile yeah, family, high family. family in front of millions. And she chose to get her lips injected at 17. She was kind of scandalized for it and shamed. And her family was, because how could they let her do that? And this girl went from being a mousy teen to on the cover of Forbes magazine, she built a billion dollar business off on of lips. lips. Mm -hmm. And who are we to say that a thousand dollars and some needle in the lips weren't, wasn't the biggest game changer of her life? change your lips, change your life. <laughs> and we are not sitting at the judge and jury table saying you're vain, 
saying you're small-minded, saying your husband must not love you, saying you're focused on the wrong things. We're saying, who the hell cares? Decide what is keeping you from living your best life. And if Beauty Lab can assist you in that, we're here for you. We're mm -hmm. not going to upsell you. We're not going to screw you. We're not going to not be with you. You know what I mean? We're yeah. going to stick with you until you like what you see in the mirror. And if injections can get you there, what a gift. Because a lot of the times, injections won't solve the problem. Well, you know? totally. And it's interesting because I do think that, like, I especially, because I've been in the industry for a long time, I'm a little more jaded. And I see, I've, you know, I've, I've seen the negative side of it and have my own personal opinions about just the ridiculous standards that we have as women um, to, in beauty. And I remember one time getting, reading a DM from someone and she said, last week in my primary class, my kids told me I looked like a witch. And she said, and I could see it. I kind of did look like a witch. And I, like, I was like horrified and felt so sad for her. And then she said, and I came in, you guys were so cute. And I just want to let you know, I looked in the mirror today and I really like, I see myself and I feel so good. And I don't think I look like a witch anymore. And I was like, Okay, for me, that's worth it. Yeah. If we help this sweet primary teacher, mom lady, who was feeling like she, her, the kids told her she looked like a wicked witch because kids are have no filters and they say what they think. And it was so awesome to have helped her feel better about herself. We and that's what we're here for. Yeah, we truly believe look good, feel good because we know that we have crappy days where we're less effective mean moms, bad friends, because we just can't fit in our jeans or don't like our hair or have a zit or, and that's, that seems vain and ephemeral and childish, but them's the breaks and that's <laughs> the world we live in. So who are we to say, oh, just dig deeper, write in your journal, go for a run. We do not fault people for trying to lose weight or getting in shape physically. We applaud them, but we somehow, you know, a woman who's like, my husband's, you know, flirting with his 18 year old secretary, and I would like to inject my lips, invest in a facial, and get Botox because I want to be more confident in my marriage and more present in my marriage. You know, not because of it. So it's not like she's keeping up the Joneses, she's owning her space in the world and changing the things that she feels empowered to change. Mm -hmm. So if like this is the currency from which we are changing money, then we want to show women how to earn money, like in by on their own terms. Anecdotally, tell us some stories that, that your clients or patients would tell about how some of these changes that others would write off as superficial has in the, in the story about the mom and the witch and the kids. That's a mm -hmm. good one. Are there others where women will say, no, this actually really improved my quality of life, made me happier and healthier. Oh, absolutely. Ever. I mean, like I, would, I would be hard pressed to find someone that it didn't. So tell us I some mean, different ways. Tell well, I mean, ways. people say Botox is your best antidepressant and they actually have done studies on it because it freezes. So it's a, a neurotoxin that basically um, temporarily paralyzes your muscles. Um, so we typically inject it here in between the eyebrows where you have this um, glabella muscle that it's the frontalis, I guess, that um, you scowl. Your worry, yeah, your worry lines. And you create these worry lines. So when we relax that muscle, gosh, we're not scowling anymore. I mean, I can't even scowl I can't even at scowl. all. This is it's me like being feeling. so mad. <laughs> and um, scowl at me. I know. I now can't. raise your eyebrows. I can a little bit. I got, I got to get a touch up, but, um, anyway, we also do the smile lines. Um, and we do all, you know, we, there are a lot of different things that you can do, but they have done studies on if you smile more then you right. feel yeah. happier. Yeah. So imagine if you can't make an angry face that, cause it, it's all connected, you know? And I remember actually my, uh, step in law he's a chiropractor and I had told, I was talking to him about it and he found the study and sent it to me. And he was like, oh my gosh, you're right. Cause he was being funny with me about, oh, your Botox and whatever. And then he was like, oh, you know what, Dre, you're actually right. Like people f can feel happier by freezing that muscle and not making those worry scowls, you know? And, you know, so this science aside, I think people just 
I mean, we have clients who have terrible acne scarring and you know what? Our faces and our skin, that's what we present to the world. And, you know, teenagers, whatever, like we, we have a lot of clients with yeah. acne scarring or with acne, but I'm thinking of a couple in particular, one girl who you know came to us for a series of treatments and did, I mean, I think she wrote something on our Google page, um, just raving about how having someone invested in her skin and giving her the right steps, the right products to use, the right treatments, how it has completely changed her life because now she's not afraid to turn on the Zoom camera, to, you know, speak up in class, to yeah, ask a question, it, to have FaceTime with people because she's not feeling like, oh my gosh, what does my skin look like? It's broken out. It looks terrible, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, that feels really good. And I think we've curated an amazing staff at Beauty Lab. And that's been one of the things that's been most fulfilling about the business is to have these women and men, we employ like four, five men, um, but mostly women and mostly young girls mm -hmm. in their early 20s. Um, we had five that were pregnant this last year that all had baby boys around the same time. And so like we are having an opportunity to work with these women who are us when we were that age, you know, having babies, but they have the, this career and they've chosen a career that is hands on with people and making people feel good about themselves, helping to improve their lives. And it's so incredibly rewarding. Absolutely. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that not only are they, do they get recognition for what they're able to contribute to their family, but then they have all of this fulfillment and opportunity outside the home where they're supported and cared for and, and productive, you know? So they have the ability to just change lives, which you don't get in a part-time job often. But we yeah. do, we try to focus on, we say love is our currency at Beauty Lab. We are not in the industry to make money. We don't, we are in the industry to change lives. And it's ridiculous for anyone to say like, it's not only how you feel about yourself in the mirror, it's about how the world responds to you. Like, you know, when you're dressed up and like everywhere you go, you're like, why are people being so nice to me? You're like, oh, it's because I have makeup on and I'm dressed up and like, they're treating me this way. It's this reciprocal thing. And it's, we can't invalidate it because it's real. And it, even if it is perceived, if something can help someone feel better and more confident and more in their body and more present in the world, why would we deny that to them? Because it's vain or superficial or invasive. And we also, I, we feel very passionate about the fact that we want this to be a safe place where it's for people that are struggling with a with gender dysmorphia or, or wanting to transition, you mm -hmm. know, and they, if you're a man and you f are transgender, you need, you want to laser all the hair off your body. Yeah. And we have if several you're a trans, trans female. Yeah. yeah. If you're a trans yeah. And female. Also, yeah. Right. And, and also if you are transitioning from female to male, um, we do a lot of Brazilian lasers for that. Well, not a lot, but we have a few that before they go and get, um, a gender reassignment surgery, they do have to be hairless. And so, and like, that's been incredibly touching and amazing. Totally. I love our transgender clients. I love our, and like jaw lines mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. ability mm -hmm. to just mm -hmm. come in mm -hmm. and like, mm -hmm. for anyone to say like your physical appearance isn't a prison, you know, like take the extreme, take someone that's transgender, take someone that's, you know, has a hook nose and doesn't want a hook nose and doesn't want a, uh, the family nose anymore. You know, and we can inject it and take the bump away and they walk out floating mm -hmm. and it, it's not that hard to do. And so to shame them for not embracing what they look like is the same way that we would say, shame someone with yellow teeth or broken teeth or roots or, you know, hair color that they don't like. Like if you want to be a blonde with giant lips and huge boobs, Let's Go for do it. it. <laughs> and now, now you. what's your excuse? Now make an impact on the world. Go and change the world. And I feel like we say that to every beauty labber, like beauty labbers, we'll get you, we'll, we'll get you. In, if you can pay the speeding tickets, we'll get you in the driver's seat. You know, we will 
take away <laughs> any impediments that are keeping you from embracing who you are and how you interact with the world. Because I will tell you, as a woman, how I look and how I'm perceived dictates 90% of my day every day. And that's just the hard truth of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's sad, but that's the world we live in. And now it's exponentially exaggerated by Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, Zoom calls, FaceTime, and it is across the demographic. It is universal. How we present our physical appearance to the world dictates the jobs we get, the friends we make, the men we attract, the women we attract, the pronouns people use with us. It is, okay, I'm gonna get deep. Okay, I love it. <laughs> we, it is part of our doctrine that our physical appearance is our reward. Mm -hmm. And it is our prime, perfect, moment in time physical appearance. And of, if that is what our goal is for eternity, of course we're gonna want, gonna want to do everything we can to get as close to that standard on earth. You just blew my mind, Heather. I've never even thought, we've talked about this so much. How have we never? I don't know why, I always think about it. Like, cause I think like, you know, like when someone's come in and they've had a glow up, you know, mm -hmm. and they've gotten their lips and they've they've gotten a facial and they're got, you know, they they just start. Yeah, you, you they're feeling feel themselves. They're in that moment, yeah. I always think, I wonder if that's what they'll pick, you know? Like, I want to be 26. I want to be 26 forever, you know? Yeah. And like you and I always say, like, we're finally coming into our own. Are we going to be like 42 forever? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, maybe. And that's like beautiful. And that's our right to decide, you know, because mm -hmm. we didn't have those tools when we were 21. We were just hoping for good genes, you know? <laughs> And yeah. so when we say the perfectionism in the church, I would challenge people to get into a conversation about why the physical appearance and why perfecting the saints is so intrinsic to our core value, not only as humans, but as sons of sons and daughters of God. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Mic drop. In the name of baby Ben yeah. Cohen, even. <laughs> <laughs> is it hard... Um, you know, I, so I'm thinking, I, I, are we blowing your mind, John? It's good. No, this is good. This is important. I mean, this is reality. This is just, mm -hmm. you, it, you know, part of what you're saying is we're looking at you and we're thinking Botox. That, I just, I'm going to say it. <laughs> I'm just going to say it. Do guys yeah. get it too? Well, we call it Brotox. Mm -hmm. Bro <laughs> Brotox. But you know, you'll, you'll be like, look how happy I am as an ex-Mormon and you'll just have this face. <laughs> look, no worry, no concern. <laughs> so there's a, the, 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 that's a really compelling argument that this is the world that we're in. And you can either um, in some sense get on board and engage in the ways that everyone's engaging where beauty and looks and health are all it's currency, you know, or you can try and like reject all that and like, yeah, purely natural, natural and, and, downplay the importance of beauty and that honestly that's been my approach sure um uh and there's some privilege to that because i don't think i'm like the ugliest guy in the world like i yeah i'm thinking know, so, it's easy so for I'm, you to say john <laughs> <laughs> no but but i mean like there's there's two sides to it and i think you guys make a compelling case for that that reality yeah um well, and John, we're kind of like the the John DeLins of um, cosmetic injections running Stay Mormon or StayLDS.com. You know, hey, if you got to be in it, this is how to do it. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. No, 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 I like that. <laughs> but the other thing I was, I was going to say is, um, is it hard for you guys to look at somebody who doesn't, doesn't get injections, doesn't do Botox, maybe just has gray hair, like Margie just has gray hair. Is it... Is it hard to be in the industry and then not to look at people who have gone that other path of just like 
Just stay natural no, and go all. like, yeah. oh, they look really frumpy. Because or, oh. you know what? Like, I mean, Margie's a great example. I don't know her personally, but I've seen her. She's a beautiful woman. And like, you can tell that she has been authentic to herself. If she walked around with shame and feeling bad about herself because of her gray hair, then I would say like, oh, for sure. Like, do what you need to do. But like, she's clearly happy and loved and feels good about who she is as she should. And so no need to change anything if like... If you're happy, that's how we, I, I think that's how you feel yeah, too, right? Yeah, like, like we have, we, what, what it is for us is, and with all love and respect, like you don't, we don't like, re- you don't get to even have an opinion. Yeah, right. Yeah, of course. Of you know course. what I mean? Of like course. if Margie, Margie or Mar- Margie, Margie, yeah, Margie. Margie, 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 I hate when I mess up. Mark, if Margie wants to shave her head, and get a septum piercing because that's beautiful to her, then we're going to help her. You know what I mean? We're going to be like, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. Come, like what it is for us is like, we want to decide for ourselves what we need to function best in the world. And if that is, you know, vain, or if that is like, it's that it's about tapping into what you want or need. Yeah. And so often it's been dictated by the way our dads and brothers think we should look or our boyfriends or, you know, and it's really saying, no, like we know who we are and we know when there's something incompatible with how we want to present to the world. And so stop shaming us for it. Stop telling us we're wrong or stop telling us that we don't need it because nobody knows what I need to be my best self except for me and except for every woman and every man and every human that walks into Beauty Lab. And all we're saying is no shame, no upsell, no fear. This is a safe place for you to tap into your desires yeah. and we'll give you the tools I to like facilitate that. it. Like but to answer your question, absolutely not. We see uh, tons of our friends don't uh, think that beauty lab is ridiculous and they would never get Botox. And it's like, you do you dude. Like, okay. yeah, I don't think yeah. they think it's yeah. ridiculous. I just think we res- they love and res- we love and respect each other in our separate yeah. That's realms. That's what I'm getting at. That's totally. what I'm getting yeah. At. yeah. We have, we well, have well, so many friends that would the, never consider it. Yeah. And the second that they say, you know what? I am feeling bad about myself. We'd be like, get in our chair. Yeah. yeah. It'll change your life. Totally. And it will, if that's important. So there's this organization called Encircle. I'm sure you've heard of it. Yeah. It's these LGBT safe houses for kids and youth. Yeah. And they have a motto, which is no sides, only love. And in the world that I'm in, where I'm trying to help people feel like you actually can find healing and joy outside of religion, it's very easy in that world for things to be very polarized, where it's like, oh, you're either an Orthodox believing Mormon or you're, you're an ex-Mormon that hates religion and is atheist. And I hate that. I That is the perception people have. People think I feed it. And I just want to go on the record. And, and Dre, you've mentioned this. Like, I hate that. Yeah. I just want, I literally, I'm not trying to get people out of the church. I'm not trying to take down the church. I re, I'm connecting with what you're saying. Because what I want is I want everybody to understand the world as it really is and then make empowered decisions with all the information about what each individual person wants to do in their lives. And if they want to decide, okay, they know about Kinderhook plates and and the papyrus and the polyandry, and they want to be Mormon, I swear to a secular God that I'm happy for them. Go do it. Yeah. But do it because you've got all the information and it comes from within versus for some other reason. And so I don't want the polarization. I just want people that get all the information and then make empowered individual decisions. And I don't even want sides. And so I guess I was kind of saying, not like, is it my job to have an opinion about whether Margie colors her hair or not, or has breast augmentation? Yeah, I'm saying that to be provocative. No, but, no, but, yeah. it's, no, but it, you, it's a crucial point because men, it's not men's business to have opinions about women's appearances, really, right? It's a woman's job mm-hmm. to get empowered and do what makes them feel good. But what I... What I, sh- you know, and it, this comes up with things like alcohol. Like sometimes people are really uncomfortable that I don't drink and they always bring it up and make a big difference. What I, I want to live in a world where you can drink or not drink and nobody makes a comment. It's just like you drink or don't drink as much or as little as you want, because that's you. You're in the church or you're religious or not, but it's you, you're, you're, you, um, it's what you, you, want. Go to, you go to beauty lab or you don't, and it doesn't matter. No sides, yeah, only we're love. On the same team. We just want informed, empowered people 
doing whatever it does to make them feel good. And that, that's what I'm really vibing with about what you guys that's are saying. That's 100% our mission statement. We say love is our currency, you know, absolutely authentic and transparent about mm -hmm. what is available to you, how it'll work, what it won't do, you know, how, how much it's going to cost, how much it's going to cost. And only no sides, only love. Is yeah. that good? Totally. It's so good. That's oh, a shout out totally. to Stephanie Sorensen Larson. Uh, that's that's and to encircle circle for the work yeah. they're doing. That's really awesome. Yeah, yeah and, that's and exactly honest, it. Yeah, we have right plenty that. of friends and people. Oh yeah, well, let me capture that high five. <laughs> oh, high five on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have plenty of friends, dear friends that that have um, done all sorts of things, and yeah. I just want it to not be an issue. I just want people to be happy. So I'm going to get people like, oh, I can't believe you. Ah, you know, they're going to be, there's going to be people that are like, I'm so glad you talked about this. We don't talk about this enough. It's so great you had these women on to talk about these things that we're all afraid to talk about. And I'm going to get haters that are like, oh, I can't believe you brought them on in this industry. And ah. right. And I just want to say, I don't want to, I don't care about any of that. Don't write me. <laughs> don't write me if you want to complain that we had this real conversation. Because this is the reality we're living in. And I love it that you guys are just owning it. Well, and because it's reality, it's what we're faced with, right? Yeah, that's the thing, John. This is the business we're in. We're used to the yeah. the yeah. feedback. Like there are a lot of people that <laughs> thank don't. Thank you for your feedback. Yeah, thank you for your feedback. <laughs> and yeah, I, there's it, it. It's a hard conversation to have because it it you know it's just a hard conversation yeah. to have. And so we get it. It's unnecessary for you to leave it in the comments, those of you who disagree. And But if you want to, we're not offended by it because we get it. Everyone has their own opinions and we are doing the best that we possibly can with what we have to deal with here. Yeah. And we want, our goal is to empower people to feel good about themselves and to have everything they possibly could need mm -hmm. to live their best lives. Yeah. And if we can be a tiny part of that, then bring it on. We're and, happy to do it. And we always say we're all in this together because mm -hmm. we're coming from a place of like community and love and empathy, you know, because some people are born. There's no such thing as natural beauty in terms of what the world expects from us. That's why we have filters and face tune and all these things. And if we can just say, listen, we're all in this together and we're going to be an ally to whomever wants the tools necessary to feel um, in sync with their physical and their inner self. Mm -hmm. And that's hard to say because it, we're not trying to take something vulgar and make it noble. We are in it to be noble. A hundred percent. Yeah, totally. Talk about, you talked about kind of the self-harm stuff and maybe even some of the, is there something around suicide in your yeah. business? Talk well, about that. Are we okay on... Yeah, we have just a few minutes. So, um, I mean, how, well, I would say like kind of the pinnacle of a moment of huge success for Beauty Lab. We're so young. We're so new. We're not physically young, but the business is. We started it in 2016, about mid-year, you mm -hmm. know. We started Mini Lip Plump in, in September. September of 2016, which was a, a new uh, outcome-based lip injection that we Invented. Invented <laughs> for people that just wanted a little something, something and didn't want to do the whole big route. And that was radical in the medical industry. And we got a lot of really mean Mormon plastic surgeons calling us and berating us and humiliating us and copying us. And we took a lot of hits, a lot yeah. of <laughs> Christmas Eve phone calls, Christmas Eve yeah. phone calls. You know who you are. <laughs> um, and that was September of 2016. And then that kind of got us on the map. We continued to disrupt the industry. We continued to grow exponentially. I mean, our growth was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And then in 2019, um, well, then we started filming, for, well, we started interviewing for the show, mm -hmm. Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. They announced it to us in October. Yeah. And it was gonna be announced at BravoCon in November of 2019. And so that was kind of this moment, this huge moment, because this is big. This is a huge international platform. Beauty Lab is going to be featured. We're going to be featured. Kind of the culmination of a lot of, of our success, but still very in its infancy. Beauty Lab had only existed for two years, and we were hitting yeah. it hard. So we were 
you know, we were really blowing things up. And so they announced it, I think on November 16th or 19th. Yeah. So this is a big moment for us because they're announcing Beauty Lab as part of this international television show, which is going to give us a chance to reach more people, be more successful and expand the business. But in addition to that, we were asked to, to judge on Shark yeah, Tank. Yeah, Utah Shark Tank. Utah Shark Tank mm -hmm. for Silicon Slopes, which yeah. for us as individuals, was us kind of being recognized for our business prowess and to give back to the community in a way that validated us as businesswomen. Mm -hmm. And it not as really not cool stay at home honor. moms with a side gig, but authentic, authorized, informed businesswomen that are on a panel for Utah Shark Tank. That was huge yeah. to us. Yeah. And that was on November 21st. So it's just kind of hitting. So we have the announcement, we're on cloud nine. We're going to start filming on November 22nd was our first day to film. November 21st, we go and we are driving down to be judges mm -hmm. on Shark Tank. Yeah. And you remember this conversation Yeah, we, we just, had. we had a talk about God randomly. And it's a conversation, Heather and I talk about religion and our own faith and faith crisis and all of the things, but... I can't remember what exactly it was that we were talking about. And I, but I referred to the CES letter and I said, well, Heather, you know, you can, you can like look that up though. Like I for no real. interest. And, and she said that she was like, you know what, Dre, like, I really don't want to like, I'm, I'm don't know that I want to know what's there mm. because like, I'm kind of good. Just like staying in my lane and believing what I believe. And, and I love my faith. Yeah. You know? I didn't want to sully it with reality. <laughs> That's true for much of life. Yeah, but it was kind of like, <laughs> it was revealing to me that I was like, because it was the first time that she acknowledged that like, there might be some things that she could find out that wouldn't work for her. And that she was like, actively choosing not mm -hmm. to explore yeah. that, you know? And because we joke about it a lot, sounds made up, you know? Sounds made up. Which is, yeah, co coined my, by my brother, Tim. And <laughs> <laughs> sounds made up, but, um, it was, it was a really poignant day. And, and I remember she said, well, Dre, do you even believe in God? And I was like, you know what? I don't know. Cause I really don't, I don't know. Sometimes I do. And sometimes I don't, but I really feel safe being in a place of, I don't know. I like that space. And it took me a long time to get there because it's uncomfortable, especially when you know everything. Now it's, I don't know. Does know everything. And like we had this really nice connection that day. And it felt like a big payoff. It felt like a big day mm -hmm. for us. Yeah. You know, it had been hard to get there. We had done this in the shadows as moms. And now we were like owning our position. We were going to have the television show, which validated a lot of our hard work. And we were celebrating. Yeah. Yeah. We were and had and had had this really lovely connection. Yeah. Like earlier that day. Anyway, um that day ended up being the very worst day of my entire life because my little brother who Well tell it like I dropped you off at Beauty Lab. Yeah. You dropped me back off at Beauty Lab and, and then I do something to I went to go drive home, I think because yeah. your car was there or something. Yeah. And I had gone upstairs up to Beauty Lab and I was at the front desk. I got a phone call on my mom's phone, but it wasn't my mom. It was my mom's best friend, Suze. And she gave me the news that my little brother, Tim, who was um, like 10 days shy of two years younger than me. So we were best friends. He's my closest sibling. Um, anyway, he had taken his life. Mm. He died by suicide on November 21st, 2019. Um, and it is... Like I've never felt pain. I've had really horrible things happen in my life, but I've never felt pain like that. And sorry, I'm not really a crier usually, but um, I just didn't know how I was ever gonna get through that. And I mean, it's the worst thing that's ever happened. And I think if there's a gift that I have, I am resilient. 
And Heather and I kind of made it our goal to find some way to find some good in that experience. It was, I mean, it rocked our world. And Tim was really close with Heather too. And he was a fixture at Beauty Lab. He was close with the whole staff. And Never missed a Saturday. <laughs> yeah. And he was a happy, good looking, successful, smart, smart, vibrant, wonderful human. Mm. Or so people thought that's what he presented. Mm. Um, and he was obviously deeply miserable in real life. Um, but people were shocked and it was shocking to us and, and devastating, devastating. And it changed my life. Um, my life is totally different now. I see things differently. I've made different decisions for my life because life is too short. And, and Tim is, was her person. Tim was your person. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah, I was. And I, if I can't do life with Tim, I'm going to have to do it different now. And so I am. Um, I just miss him. So anyway, it's suicide and mental health has like kind of become our platform. And because we've been touched by it and it was so unnecessary, we didn't need to lose Tim we did and so like us making lemonade <laughs> out of the pile of shit <laughs> that was delivered to us through that experience has been to really channel as much energy as we can at beauty lab and just in our own personal lives towards raising awareness for mental health specifically for mental health with men you know I think it's especially in our culture, it's really tough for men to talk and to express their feelings and to feel safe, to um, share when they're struggling. And so 75%, statistically, 75% of all suicides are committed by men. Mm -hmm. And so women can talk and get therapy and cry on their friend's shoulder and go to lunch and have breakdowns, but we don't make those same allowances for men. Mm -hmm. And we grieve that because we don't know if it would have made a difference to Tim, but we have to believe that it could make a difference to someone, you know? Yeah. And so this year has really been um, huge for us as far as um, having a dialogue about mental health. It's something, you know, we have a therapist on staff for our staff um, because we want everybody to get therapy. We want everyone to have opportunities to invest in their own mental health. We also started the Don't Leave Foundation, which is a cute hashtag that we started just on our social media when people would leave. We'd be having so much fun at Beauty Lab. We'd say, don't leave, don't leave. And then as they'd walk out, we'd film and we and that was our hashtag. Don't yeah, leave. don't leave. And so we and actually we had so many of Tim. Yeah, we had so many like every Saturday he'd come in, don't leave Tim. And so we did start a foundation called Don't Leave. Um, it had, we weren't sure what we wanted to do with it. We just knew we wanted to do something about raising um, awareness for suicide and also uh, just mental health in general. Um, and then we've kind of turned it into basically, Heather had this idea years ago that she wanted to treat clients of ours who had um, overcome drug addiction, who had track mark um, scars and We've always talked about, we did a couple. We did a couple of people that were willing mm -hmm. to say, you know, I used to be a heroin addict and I have these scars. And we were like, oh, let us treat you for free. You know, but it was hard to find people and mm -hmm. we didn't really have a forum to advertise it. Yeah. But when we wanted to do Don't Leave, you said specifically like statistically suicide prevention doesn't work. You know, it's like suicide prevention. So we were like, what can we do that's tactile and can make a difference, like the starfish mentality, like it makes a difference to this one, you know, <laughs> yeah. like we didn't want a 1-800 number. We didn't want to, we wanted to, to one by one chip away at shame and grief and guilt 
and fear and triggers and mental health mm -hmm. awareness, you yeah. know? So that's what, was, that's what you married together. Yeah, so what we're offering now at Beauty Lab is free self-harm scar and track mark scar treatment. It's uh, just a quick laser treatment. You typically need several. Um, it's never gonna get rid of them fully, but we personally know people who have self-harm scars and it holds them back. It makes them feel like, you know, I have a friend who was stressed about spring coming because he's like, I'm going to have to wear short sleeves now and I can't cover these up. And my coworkers, my colleagues are going to know that I've done this. And that was kind of what inspired us. And so we offer free treatments for anybody who wants to come in. No questions asked. Um, Absolutely we'll do it as free. many times yeah. as we need to. And the response has been staggering. It has like it's changed our whole staff and it's added meaning to have someone come in. Someone so much braver than like I could ever be and more mm -hmm. courageous and, and more humble, you know, cause like my harm, like I hid from all of, I mean, I've never self harmed, but like I hid from my divorce. I hid from my faith. I hid, you know, to, to toe the line. And we see these incredibly brave souls that come in and say, I, you say it best. Yeah. They just say, yep, I, this is, I've touched the dark and I didn't want to be here or I felt like I had no value or I felt like I was in so much pain that I would rather hurt myself or try to die than to be here, but I stayed and I'm, I'm going to do my life. I'm alive and I'm here and yeah. And just the amount of vulnerability that these clients have and the humility also and bravery, yeah. it's staggering. And we have had a huge response. There are a lot of people in Salt Lake city who have struggled to the point where they have scarring on their body to show it. And it has made this year meaningful and really amazing. And In so, a year that was rife mm -hmm. with pain and grief. Grief. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what we're doing. And, and don't leave is like... It's all we care about. <laughs> it's all we care. I know. We're just like, Botox, we're like what? You want your lips done? Wait. Yeah. <laughs> your friend has a track mark from heroin. You see. Bring yeah. her in. Yes. And then we'll talk about your lips. Like, yes. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so that's. Talk about beauty. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. And I, and I always say like, just like with service, when you render service, it comes back to you tenfold. It's an honor for us to be an ally to our friends in the community that need help, you know? It's an honor for us to share the pain we have felt from losing Tim and have people help us somehow bridge that pain, you know? Mm -hmm. By like accepting the service. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that's what it feels it's like. Reciprocal, it, it feels it, very reciprocal. It does, and it feels like you know, when you're sitting back there with a client and they're, you know, showing their wounds, their scars, their darkest point, it feels like a little bit of Tim, at least for me. That's, I feel like he would be proud and I feel like he, he felt that too, obviously. And I'm glad that the people that stayed, stayed. I'm glad that they're here. That they didn't leave. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I feel, because Tim wasn't my brother, I feel like, to me, he was kind of a hero. He was kind of the underdog advocate. He was kind of the hype guy. He would sense in a room, he's so empathetic, he could sense somebody that was out of place and he would rally them. It, he did it for me many times. Mm -hmm. And I feel like he liked to just help the one. And I feel like this one-on-one -on -one way that we honor him with Don't Leave is like he would he would be proud of that. Yeah. Because it makes a significant difference to one person in that one moment, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's not like big sweeping phone a friend, you know? It's yeah. like it's it's real 
get down on your knees and love somebody and fix and do whatever you have in your power to fix them. And we have lasers and we have medical experts and we have time and we have money and we will dedicate it time and again to helping anyone that's brave enough to ask for it or show up and yeah. receive it. Yeah. And you have big, beautiful hearts is what you have. <laughs> that's what you guys have. I Don't leave. Strong. Don't leave. That's so beautiful. Don't leave. <laughs> I love it. Don't leave. Don't leave. I say that all the time when, when I'm with people that I love. That's what I say. I say, don't leave. Yeah. Don't leave. Don't leave. Don't leave. <laughs> don't leave. That's great. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. So beautiful. Thank you. You guys are uh, multidimensionally beautiful. Lips, cheeks, hearts, <laughs> souls. souls. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I have bad news and good news. Bad news is we're not done. We didn't get to everything we wanted to get to. The good news is I think you said part three. Did you say part three? <laughs> Just like the triptych, we are a sacred collection of three texts. <laughs> you guys will come back for one more? Yeah, yeah we'd love to. Rocky we got to talk about Rocky. Heather's Rocky. faith. We got to get, we going to need a full yeah. episode. Through my faith crisis. Yeah, a full episode dedicated Superman to that. Superman 3 was the best Superman. <laughs> Rocky 3, possibly the best Rocky. <laughs> Rather Rocky gay and Dre part good. 3. Rocky 3 was good. Rocky 3 was great. Yeah. Home Alone 3, debatable, but Drether, yeah. the third, we'll come back. <laughs> I married Billy Gay, the third. It's a lucky there we go. It's a lucky I have three kids. Together. You have three kids? Oh. Father, really. son, holy ghost. Yep. Yeah. Rule of threes. Oh gosh, rule of threes. Here we go. <laughs> So we are going to, don't go away. We are going to come right back another day. Hopefully this week we'll figure that out. And we're going to do part three where we'll talk about Heather's faith journey, uh, other things about Heather and Dre's uh, awesome partnership and relationship and friendship. And, uh, and we'll figure out if there's some things about Real Housewives we can talk about without making the producers mad. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. But uh Answer, no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's not. But uh, thank you for joining us. You guys, thank you so much for thank coming you, on. Super powerful, important themes. So wise and vulnerable and powerful and inspirational. So I love you guys. Don't leave. We love you too. Don't leave. <laughs> Don't leave. You got to go. <laughs> yeah, we got to go. We got to pick up our kids. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, All right. guys. Thanks for okay. having us, God John. be with you till we meet again. All right. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. We'll see you again soon on Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care.